Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us on another edition of Table Talk. Table Talk, for anyone who's coming in for the first time, is not a cooking show, though we will talk about cooking. It's not a recipe show. Recipes may come up. But we talk about things that are adjacent to food in different kinds of ways, because one of the things that I have discovered in the course of Table Talk and before Table Talk in a group that I run called Simple Recipes for Complicated Times, one of the things that really brought, came home to me, and you can, uh, you know, in the little chat that Kurosho and I were having just now about uh, Parvati Bai and all that, as you can see, food pretty much intersects with so many other things that pretty much all of life. So it leaves us a nice wide open canvas. And my only, the way that I select my guests on this is one, that they should have this adjacency to food. And two, that I should have fun talking to them. And well, Kurush exemplifies that. He's great fun to chat with since I first met him as a professor in Mumbai University at uh, the uh, Center for Extramural Studies where uh, they were doing this lovely exhibition that was coming up, which was about uh, his board, the various kinds of board games and things like that that Indians played in historical times, uh, whatever the uh, evidence that we had of the different kinds of games from the precursors to chess and snakes and ladders and things like that. And since then, we've had this largely online acquaintance. We've never met in the flesh since that time, but I've attended a lot of his talks on and lectures, his Instagram lives. And yeah, I'm just saying that you guys are going to have fun listening, whatever it is. And I'll try and get out of the way as much as we can. But Kurush, thank you so much for coming in again. And even more so for coming in again at very short notice. Thank you very much, Peter. Always a pleasure to be on Table Talk. Uh, to double on Table Talk uh, is a singular honor. Uh, so wouldn't have let it go for anything, even if you told me this morning. And uh, I always have fun talking to you. I always learn a lot of stuff. And uh, there are there are some people with which with whom I'm very comfortable. You're one of them. And the fact that I've only met you once doesn't kind of get in the way of that. Thank you so much, Kurush. Thank you. I thought today we'd talk about the stuff that we talked about the last time. Also widen that discussion a bit. So what we talked about last time was that uh, what ancient Indians ate from all evidence that we had from uh, archaeology, which is Kurush's academic discipline, uh, anthropology. Uh, and generally from reading a lot and discussing food online and the things that he's learned, we widened that discussion the last time to talk about things like spices and what is native and what is not and that perpetual and annoying debate about what is authentic and what is really Indian, which if you followed Table Talk and if you followed Kurosh or if you followed any of my guests, you know that authentic is such a weird word to be using for food because food travels, it morphs, it changes, people adopt it, they adapt it, they make it work for them. They, you know, food goes into other places, changes into other things. And what is native? Because again, food has traveled. Very little of Indian food, uh, of the spices with, with, I mean, what exemplifies Indian food to a lot of other people is the mirchi and the mirchi is not Indian, right? But we have taken it to our hearts. And not me personally, I hate chilies, but uh, by and large, it will be very difficult to go anywhere in India without finding chilies as part of the cuisine, potatoes, onions, things like that. But yeah, so Kurush and Kurush's other, the thing that I want to spend a little more time on this time as well is about Kurush's other part of his life, which is the catering business, uh, both of which he inherits from his mother. Uh, his mother was an archeologist and a uh, well-known one at that who happened to be a woman at the wrong time at that point. And so was uh, a woman archeologist, didn't get as many breaks as the men did at that time. Things have, I think, changed now. But uh, Kurush himself has, uh, is a professor of archeology, span ran the, uh, the master's program in Mumbai University, which was revived after some 150 years or something, if I remember right. And new after 160 years. Right, and uh, continued on uh, 
we did talk about his innings at Mumbai University and I don't want to spend too long on that frustrating time that he had there. But I want to talk also about the catering part of the thing, which his mother was the famous uh, KP Gala, who uh, if you've been to, if you know any Parsis and if you know Parsi food in Bombay, you know that that is a name to reckon with. And Kurush inherits that legacy as well and has continued it and with his wife and uh, recently discovered that his kitchen is very, very close to my house. So I should uh, drop in one of these days there as well. Sure. But yeah, so Kurush, archaeology, food, and how did you, I mean, we, for those who are coming in for the first time, if you could sort of briefly go over that. So very simply, um, grew up on archaeology, um, then segued into food with my mom running a food business. Uh, it was something that happened very organically for my mother, the food business at least. And uh, I thought this was what I wanted to do when I was 11. Uh, when I was in my uh, 11th and 12th, I was doing all her shopping in the mornings. Uh, I'd go to the market, bring everything in, uh, as in mutton, chicken, fish. Uh, we had fixed people who brought in vegetables and I'd go to market, I'd go home only after that. And if there was what we called fancy in those days, which was uh, broccoli, bell peppers, uh, bok choy, Chinese cabbage. Um, what else was there? Uh, celery parsley, of course. So there was one man in the whole of Crawford Market who sold these things. His name was Anand. He's now a very big wheel in the vegetable business. and. Runs out of some massive office somewhere in Navi Mumbai that I have no clue where he is. And uh, all of this came mainly from Bangalore in those days. And uh, so that was something I'd do sometimes. And you know, we had a lot of functions where we did a lot of buffets in those days. And my mom loved doing salads. She was very well known for salads. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, salads are not about vinaigrette dressings. When you're a Parsi, if it doesn't have mayonnaise in it, it's not a salad. It's a kachubar. Okay, yeah, so green salads are all kachubars of various ilk. Uh, and if they don't have onions in them, Parsi is completely sneer at them and think that they have no purpose to exist. Of course, the times they are changing and we do a lot of salads these days which don't have mayonnaise in them. But that's... Uh, but, so we would decorate these salads with a lot of fruit. So that was another one of my jobs to get. Uh, I learned Marathi on the job. I had a great time haggling. I'd be roped in for emergencies to go and buy prawns in the evening because Fort Market would be open in the evening and get some really lovely prawns there. So I grew up with the business. Uh, I still remember I was doing my HSC exams and I was still going to the market in the morning. So as far as the family was concerned, this was a family business. You lived at home. Uh, you might as you didn't really have much of a choice. You did what you had to do. So evenings when we were catering outdoors, uh, I couldn't go out anywhere, even if I wanted to. Not to mention I had 8.35 curfew. Not an 8.30 curfew, an 8.35 curfew. Because uh, my job for the family, not for the family business, was to make sure water was filled. We lived in VT. And there's a bloody perennial water supply issue over there. One of the reasons I moved to Navi Mumbai. 8.35, I had to prime the pump and by 8.40, I had to get it going. If I didn't get the damn pump going by 8.45, there was no water the next day. Uh, it can be terrible, you know, when there's no water the next day, what you've got in your tanks means there's just no chance of a bath for anybody. If you don't fill water for two days, you need to go to a nearby restaurant to go to the loo because there's no water for nothing. That's mm. how bad things used to be. So, yeah. uh, you know, life was very, very different. I mean, slow in its own way, fast in a crazy way. And uh, I had a blast doing this. I did my uh, bachelor's in uh, engineering culture and history, double major from Xavier's. And my trajectory was to go to Deccan College to do an MA and a PhD in archaeology. A PhD if I got a scholarship. Um, got the University Grants Commission, NET and GRF. Uh, sometimes I wonder whether it was a good thing or not. And uh, then, you know, one had no choice but to do the damn PhD because one had opened one's mouth and said, if I get a scholarship, I'll do PhD. And the only scholarship I applied for was the damn UGC. Mm. So did a PhD uh, four years down the line, realized I'd been very badly let down by a critical component in my PhD. 
almost went berserk. I mean, this happened when I was about three years into a PhD. By the fourth year, I knew I had to give it up. Luckily, I'd been doing something else alongside because nothing was happening on the topic, actually. And my guide turned around and says, why don't you shift topic? So I did. So it took me a little over seven years to finish my dissertation. Took another year for the damn thing to be awarded. More than a year, actually. And uh, I came back home in 1998 before I finished my PhD because I realized I had to do something. Mom had just had a very bad accident at home. We had had a fire accident. And we shifted the business back home at that time. And uh, we were in between clubs and venues. And she shut it down for three months. So I came back, I restarted it. And uh, in my name and became a caterer. So that was my fallback position. Knowing fully well that archaeology wouldn't pay the bills in those days. Just like it hadn't for her. So uh, things are changing now. It's not that they aren't. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things like food studies. When I ventured into the world of food studies, I realized that nobody in India does food studies. I mean, food studies in India is catering college. Mm -hmm. Or it's nutrition or dietetics. Oh, sorry, dietics. No, dietetics, sorry. And I was like, but what about food? The history of food, the archaeology of food, the anthropology of food, the sociology of food, food and politics. I mean, you know, Peter, very few people really realize how intensely political food is. I mean, there's virtually no ingredient that you can show me where I can't show you how politically uh, violated it has been at some point in its life. Right from rice and dal upwards to beef. I mean, you know, as simple as that and as complex an issue as that. So all food is politics and uh, nobody talks about it. The fact that the British in India in the Second World War had a policy called the denial of rice policy. Uh, I've never seen it in a single textbook. 1941, the British government declared a denial of rice and boats policy. This was a specific policy. It was passed by parliament. And the reason for this was to deny rice and boats, as in food and transportation to the Japanese when they would come invading India. Uh, we stopped them at Imphal. Mm -hmm. That's a different story altogether. But this is what caused the Bengal famine. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. It was, this is why it was the man-made famine. We took away rice and we took away the ability to get fish yeah. from a people that lived on rice and fish. So, you know, uh, I mean, Churchill's hands are covered in the blood of those Bengalis who died. Absolutely. Completely drenched in them. And because he was prime minister for no other reason, forget about him advocating it or not advocating it. The buck has to stop somewhere and that's where it stopped in those days. So we just don't talk about these issues. We don't talk about food in so many different ways. We don't understand how there is a vibrant inward diaspora into India, which brings food and ingredients and techniques, how there is an outward diaspora of Indians and what they do to Indian food when they go abroad. You know, all over Jamaica, the national meal is a roti and a red. And it's a large chapati folded four times over a mixture of chickpeas, potatoes and chicken, all of which have been curried and are all thrown in one after the other onto this dry chapati and turned into a kind of burrito. And mm -hmm. you drink it with something called a red, which was the most I mean, the closest thing to it is probably the good old Parsi raspberry from Dukes, now from Padanjis. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't even taste like that. And was created by an Indian gentleman who wanted to open a cold drink business. Mm -hmm. And he actually, you know, the, the, the trajectory is even more hilarious. He didn't have money. So when he wanted bottles, he heard that there was a company in Canada shutting down. So he bought all their bottles, saying, I'll use those bottles now. And when I make enough money, I'll start making my own bottles. When the bottles arrived, they're all branded. So there was an aeroplane on it with a guy popping his head out of it. And they had the brand name on it, Solo. And not only were they branded, the bloody brand was embossed out of the bloody bottle and painted upon. Yeah. So he had no choice but to release his cold drink and call it Solo. <laughs> so, And that now is the brand. I mean, yeah. if he ever changed it, he wouldn't know what to do with it. So you get a Solo red and you get a Solo banana. It's the only carbonated banana drink that I know of in the world. I'm dying to get my hands on a bottle. I wouldn't think that you would carbonate a banana drink. 
Yeah. But see, there's, there's, there's so much stuff in food. Uh, you know, uh, I remember when Pepsi and Thumbs uh, Coke came into India early on. They brought some very interesting drinks in summers and the Indian public just didn't get it. There was a an apple drink from both sides. One had a green apple drink, one had a regular apple drink. They were both really very nice. They didn't catch on. Fruity also had a green apple. Yes. Uh, sorry, no, that was green mango. My, green my, mango. My mistake. And they also had a beautiful bitter orange, yeah. which was gorgeous with vodka, but mm. I happily misspent youth. Uh, but I found out about Japan. You got to th- see some of the flavors they have in Japan, Peter. Baobab. There's a baobab Pepsi. I mean, baobab grows in Africa mm. and Madagascar. How the hell is a baobab cold drink Japanese? Mm. But it is. So, you know, this food is this amazing thing. It's an amazing leverer. It's about contact. It's about tradition. It's about movement. There is so much continuously happening in the foodscape and we don't study any of it. Mm. And the more I say this, the more I realize that there is so much need to learn. Sorry, one second. Something started playing in my browser, which I need to cut. No, I haven't drunk Bovanto, but I've heard that it's like drinking Bovril. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, it, it, it's like Marmite. There are people who love Marmite and the people who hate Marmite. I don't know anybody who's okay with Marmite. You know, I hate Marmite. I like Marmite. There, there you go. You like Marmite. You're not just okay with it like, ah, oh, Marmite. Nobody is blur about Marmite. Huh. You either like it or you really dislike it. I dislike it. And, yes. and Vegemite. Yes, and- yes, yes. Veg- Cheesemite. There's yeah. a Cheesemite. I haven't tried that. Which is vegetarian cheese Marmite. Yeah. I have a bottle that I think should have fossilized by now. It's about <laughs> probably 15 or 20 years old. I haven't had the guts to ever open it. Purely because it, it revolts me. Cheesemite. Cheesemite. Okay. Just the thought of it. You mean a vegetarian Marmite with cheese. Yeah, that's kind of unfortunately named, no? Cheesemite. Yes, Cheesemite. Yeah. yeah, it was a friend of mine uh, in Trinidad, with, uh, Trinidad and Tobago, who was talking about, and had opened such a set of windows for me of something called the double, which, if you look at it, is basically chana batura, but looked at differently. And double is both single, you don't ask for two doubles, you no. ask for two double, right? And that story of it, it's Indian diaspora labor brought their food over there. It is basically something that is an, uh, a large puri with curried chickpeas covered up, served out there. And that made a migration to Canada where it became a chain there. There were disputes. But you know why the Canada connect? The, uh, one of the guys migrated. No, not just that. Huh. Okay, so if you go to uh, the the entire region over there, Trinidad, mm. Jamaica, all of those places, they all eat dal. Yeah. And it's kind of D-A-H-L, dal. Yeah. But there is only one kind of dal. Unlike India where you have moong dal, chana dal, masur dal, urad dal, there is only one dal. And it's all chana dal. You know why? Because the Indians ate dal. When they were taken there by the British, mm. they had to be fed dal, right? Where to grow this dal? You can hardly grow it in India and ship it down to the West Indies. So it was grown in Canada. Okay. And the only thing that bloody grew in Canada out of all the dals was chana dal. Hmm. So chana dal was the dal that was supplied to them for about 50 years or 100 years. And no other dal. So by the time they finished, you know, it was growing like mad and being exported by the Canadians to anybody who wanted to eat dal. And when these guys from Trinidad went there, they were like, ooh, the mother lord of Dal is here. Yeah. As daft as that. These are the choices, you know, and this is how choices are made for us. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about diasporas and 
this whole concept, I mean, one of the conversations that I had here was with a couple of people who are academics and research, one an academic, one a storyteller, researching various Creole foods. And that entire, uh, the whole thing of the way food migrates and all that was pretty fascinating just to, because when we look at India, I mean, we have started talking a lot about the influences on Indian food, but we, India as a cultural, Indian food as a cultural ambassador and Indian food going into the past and how Indian food has migrated to different places. I haven't heard that much about that. And I hear a little bit about the indentured labor going off to, you know, Africa and or to the Americas. But uh, that influence has spread in other ways at different times as well. And, and I was coming across to the different ways that things happen. I was watching the set, this documentary on Amazon Drive on uh, El Bulli and uh, Ferran Adria. Fascinating. It's in Spanish and the subtitles, you have to follow the subtitles if you don't know Spanish, which is, I'm watching it twice for most times because I'm pausing, then going back, looking at the visuals and then looking back again. But one of the things that came there, they said, you know, no one puts coconut in fish as a discovery. And I was like, please, sir, yeah. please. <laughs> you know, but that entire thing of the way that food travels, migrates, the different tastes and what is completely alien in one culture is intrinsic to others. So, I mean, staying away from, we'll come back to Indian food as such, but what, can we just riff a bit on this, the way that Indian food has traveled in historic uh, Indian food is tall, but just think of the taboo of milk and fish in India. Huh. We don't cook milk and fish together. It's mm. al almost like we're Jewish and we don't do meat and milk yeah. together, you know? Yeah. And you go abroad and everybody bakes their fish in a nice, cheesy, creamy white sauce. Mm. And you're like, ah! And what was I told when I was growing up? You get leukoderma if you do it. Okay. okay? And I'm like, yeah, I can see that's why all those white people is white. This is like completely covered in dense, covered in leukoderma, is it? Huh? Yeah. So, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, it's, it's funny how food travels and how you adjust. I was just talking to my friend Kalyan. We're doing a series of fun uh, talks on a weekly basis, which we hope to do. We are both very lazy people. Mm. But we did the drop the first episode last week. And uh, I remember telling him that you know, everybody thinks Patrani Machi is something unique to the Parsis and is something that is uniquely Indian. I said, yes and no. So there's a lot of Caspian white fish that's wrapped in vine leaves and it's stuffed full of greens because the Persians love their greens, dried, fresh, whatever. So then come back here, you got no vine leaves, but you got these ubiquitous banana leaves. You got this pomfret, which is like white fish. Okay, it's not a very powerful, overpowering fish by itself. So it'll take on flavors. And you got coriander and mint. So you don't have celery and parsley, tough. Then you, suddenly green chilies are introduced. Then the Portuguese also introduced vinegar. So we add that vinegar. We, we got lots of coconut growing on the coast. We make a coconut chutney like the Gujaratis do. And uh, we wrap our fish in banana leaves with coconut uh, green chutney. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's basically a diasporic population taking the memory of a dish from Persia and changing it to something else. And honestly, uh, it sounds way more exciting to me than Caspian whitefish stuffed with dill and parsley mm. and wrapped in vine leaves. The only difference is you can eat those vine leaves. You shouldn't really eat banana leaves even if you can. And then my friend Krishnan, who's uh, Krishna Ashok, who's been here, tells me that there is some whole thing about the wax on those leaves, uh, which is the most important thing about those leaves. They have some, there's some funky words that are too old to to ratamara them any longer and he says that is what makes the banana leaf do its thing that's why you can wrap food in banana leaves and it kind of forms an you know impervious -ish membrane to them so there is so much like this that happens of just think of it peter if you go all over india you're talking about chilies india has more varieties of chilies than the rest of the world put together and it's not like the rest of the world doesn't grow chilies right mm. Uh, we have more chilies than the poor Mexicans, and that's where chilies came from. Yeah. Holy cow. How do you account for that? And facts like, you know, you go to Italy, 
and you eat parmigiano reggiano and you get all very accenty about the whole thing hmm. and uh, you find out that half the cheese in that area is made out of milk that is being grown for you by sardar jis in italy and if that isn't enough way before the sardar jis got there the italians have been making buffalo milk cheese what do you think mozzarella is it's buffalo milk cheese how did the buffalo get there mm-hmm. so the buffalo basically got there from india via persia through bloody mesopotamia somehow made the long walk across turkey swam the hellespont uh, went through greece and ended up in northern italy mm-hmm. the buffalo i mean of all things and then you hear about those guys called the romani who went all the way from india and then you start wondering whether they took buffaloes yeah yeah that, you know that, because that would then make such amazing sense yeah yeah those are the guys took the buffaloes with them Uh, uh, but luckily for us there are buffaloes in mesopotamia that went from india also during the bronze age so maybe this way maybe that way but just to think that there are sardarjis who speak punjabi and italian and no other language i have a friend of mine who is a cheese maker she was there she said it was murder to talk to them because they either speak absolutely fluent machine gun italian or they speak punjabi hmm. and they 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 more italian than the italians probably Uh, there are sardarjis in south india putting up farms in karnataka i mean can you imagine sardarji farmers in karnataka that's because a lot of karnatikas are not farming and the sardars are like you know land back home in punjab is horribly expensive most of it is sand water is difficult to get and then there's karnataka with this cheap land there and there's tamil nadu next door with even cheaper land there let's grow go there and grow some stuff and then you always have a cousin whom you can call down no that's so indian you know once things start getting good you can call a cousin who has a cousin who has a brother and then it is it's just all very incestuous and in the family and before you know it there's an entire community and the somebody's sister is marrying somebody's brother and vice versa and uh, hallelujah this the seek farming guys but i have been reading this fascinating piece about the one of the former uh soviet republics uh having this large population of sikh farmers who have come there and completely uh is you know become part of that uh, kind of culture I, i can't remember i think it was uzbekistan but i would stands yeah one of the i didn't want to do one of the stands because then i would you know i would sound like an ignorant american who's i'm sorry i'm going to that very, very very politically incorrect <laughs> no 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 um, i, I sh- I should have known be- known this, and I can't. And yeah, I, I should also. I should also dig this out. Do you know that one of the earliest migrations by the Punjabi farmers was to Mexico? Yes, I have read about this. I have read about it. It is an entire substrata, very quiet, of Punjabi Mexican farmers, uh, south of California into Mexican mm. uh, Baja and those areas. And uh, I came across them in a very different uh, this thing. So. this might not be the right place for it but uh, uh you know the there, there's a lot of underworld issues in uh, and those kind of issues in uh, mexico right but mm-hmm. nobody messes with the sardar mm-hmm. even back there you don't mess with the sardar because if you cut one of them they all bleed mm-hmm. and you really don't want absolutely bad shit mad sardars coming down in tempos to do you in one of my favorite food non food stories of the sardarjis is uh, back when i was younger and stupider i was doing giving my uh, final exams for my ty and i was in siddharth college was my center and an ultimate exam there was a tall sardarni girl in class parallel row to me and there was this girl behind her who said kabhi karne dena hath baju kar and this girl instead of you know just ignoring her put her dupatta over her papers thing like oh my dead body kind of thing so there's a lot of pss pssing and then the invigilator finally looked up from her book and was like what the hell is going on over there and i was wondering how people had time to copy mm. uh, and uh, while going out she threatened her and said 
तू बाहर आ मैं तेरे को देखती बरोबर सो गैलेंट्री वाज नॉट येट डेड कंप्लीटली सो ऑन माय वे आउट आई नोटिस शी वाज कैना हैंगिंग अराउंड द डोर नॉट गोइंग आउट एंड देयर वाज टू गाइस एंड दिस गर्ल कैन ऑफ लॉटरिंग इन द कॉरिडोर सो व्हेन शी फाइनली मेड हर वे आउट आई वाज मेक माय वे आउट एंड आई डिड दिस होल फिल्मी थिंग आई सेड चल 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 आई हैव बीन वेटिंग फॉर यू कम लेट्स गो आई यू नो कैन पुट माय सेल्फ इन बिटवीन सो टू डाउन जस्ट टू क्लिक टू क्लिक एंड शी कैन रन डाउन द स्टेयर्स एंड वन ऑफ दोस गाइस लुक्ड एट मी एंड सेड जाड़े तेरे को कल सुबह बरोबर देखता है Mm. and i was like oh fuck mm. okay chivalry is going to be very expensive at this rate they're going to beat me up i'm going to miss my last paper i'm going to fail my ty my mother's going to throw me out of the house you and uh, far ahead i say yeah <laughs> I'm, a long, i'm a long distance type guy okay, okay. so next morning i've already called up my friends and my friends are as fat to as i am and but they they friends so they four of them have turned up to defend me and get beaten up with me hmm so we get there and uh, you know the siddharth college entrance right mm. and uh, so we get there and i can see this girl pointing out and there these 10 15 guys over there who all look like they're going to wail the tar out of me so i'm ready to equip myself properly i mean if i'm going to go down i'm going to take a few with me okay but there's no way that we're going to take down some 15 20 of them and across the road is a beat up old matador temple i don't know if today's kids even know what a matador temple looks like uh, the windows in the back are all painted over and faded and battered on it is this sack really badly painted sack of flour and it says roshan atta okay mm. and i kind of say okay time to do it and i start walking to the steps and the back of that temple opens up completely like a good 90s cheap b grade movie and some 30 sardars come out of it with hockey sticks okay i don't know don't you know how you can put them in there okay and this girl is with them and she said ye wo bhai sahab the unhone mujhe meri madad ki meri and i'm i'm getting this full on drama it's full b grade in the movie bhai sahab you saved our sister's honor Like no, no, they were not really worried about the honor. They were going to beat her up, but uh, I was not going to say that loudly, was I? And they kind of marched in with me like an honor guard around me. The guys on the steps of Siddharth College, man, they disappeared like a pat of butter on a hot tawa. They were just gone. Okay, they came up to class. They made a scene over there by sitting outside. The principal came to find out what the hell is happening. Yeah. and they told him off and said what do you think you're doing what kind of principal are you that these kind of things are happening in your college and whatever full drama they waited right till the end they saw me down into a taxi and all that and uh, i was like i never thought roshan atta would leave such a lasting impression in my mind but it did food yeah 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 This is fascinating stuff. I remember of, uh, I mean, I read about the Maya, the Punjabi Mexican thing in the context of reading something on California history and uh, the whole New Mexico and Mexico and uh, like I found one of the articles which I posted in chat, but uh, that was just a random one. This is not the one I was referring to. But yes, uh, and I think we were discussing this at some point again, looking at this the the diaspora of food and the way that food moves around. the appe pan and what how it came in and how that has you know from some people say the dutch uh, are, you know the, the evil scheme of pan yes there was some when i remember posting about this and there was some discussion about that but how that it has gone from there into other parts of the world as well via india into different parts of india and then via the dutch or by other means into uh, different parts of southeast asia east asia i saw these lovely these things of chinese street side food using a similar kind of device but huge you know with a swivel in the center and the guy is working it like a conveyor belt really you know by the time he's done the first set and has completely swiveled around the neck it's ready for the next layer and stuff like what that what the guys in japan mm. making takoyaki it's the same thing yep. so can you imagine the popaji of the parsis and the takoyaki of the japanese the bits of octopus legs sticking out of it and shaved tuna on it yeah. have the same common origins of their you know vessel of formation 
the Dutch profoye pen. Mm. Beeble schema. So yeah, it's, it's there is there, just just think of the tawa, think of the steamers that we have. And yeah, in some cases, I agree that form and function, you know, form follows function, and therefore there will be some forms repeated. Mm. But uh, we see this, you know, uh, I keep telling people, this is one of my favorite examples. Uh, you go to Karnataka in the early Iron Age and you get these beautiful megalithic burials. Everything is identical. But you know that at least from 3,000 years ago, mm. the North Kannada, South Kannada, Kannada divide has been there because when you look at the vessels inside these megalithic cysts, okay, that have been put there, uh, the eating vessels are in North Kanara, in the megalithic burials, are all platters. And in South Kanara, they're all bowls. Because even then, the, the Nachni, so basically a rice did not happen in South India till somewhere around 2,600 years ago. Yeah. Okay. And then even then it was very elite. So uh, the guys in the North were very much like our Maharashtrians eating bhakris, which they still do till today. Nachni bhakris. But the guys in the South were eating ragi mudde, which they would make into balls and dip into gravies, for which you need bowls. You can't eat mudde out of a platter, and you can't eat bhakri out of a bowl. So, you know, these are the things that food tells you, that some of these things are so old, and some of these things are so fascinating in this manner, that you have traditions that go back that far. I keep telling people that the idli was originally all urat, and they look at me like I've grown horns. And oh, but how will it taste? I'm saying, you should try it. Because I didn't know till I tried it. And then I was like, damn, damn, it tastes good. You know? And uh, you add a little rice to it because it, it's cheaper by then. And it makes the udad go longer. And then you add a little more. And then you add a little more. And then you're doing 50-50. Mm -hmm. And then before you know it, it's a handful of udad dal just for, I don't know, flavor, taste, slipperiness. I don't know what it is. So, and uh, it's still the same people making the, well, technically same Italy. Why don't we ever call these things breads, Peter? And for, surprisingly, I have a lot of South Indians who get upset about it. Idiopums are bread. Dosas are bread. Idlis are bread. Aphes are bread. These are all breads. Bread does not have to be wheat paste. There is no law that says bread has to be wheat paste. All over America, it used to be cornbread. Mm. And, you know, that kind of thing. So, buckwheat, pancakes are breads. They're basically meant to be your staple and you make it go down a little better with something on it. So, Sidney Mintz has this beautiful article that he wrote years ago. I mean, he's the farmer of, father of modern food anthropology. And everybody talks about his book, uh, uh, Sweetness and Power, which is about, you know, why sugar made slavery possible. As in that slavery happened because of sugar. And few people realize that. Um, but they did even back then. That's another story. But Sydney Mintz basically says that all over Asia, it's the starch that is the main hero. Everything else is to make the starch go down. Mm. Okay. So, you know, your little bit of achar on the side, your little bit of chutney on the side is just to make the starch more palatable. It's incidental. The mm. reason that our dals are thin is because we can't afford too much dal. Because dal is expensive. Mm -hmm. So you make thinner dals. Now, of course, everybody get all very upset about it. But these are truths. And we like to mask these truths because we don't like to say we were not well off. We were badly off. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to believe that the past was this utopian past where there was you know, milk and honey flowing down the Ganges and the Kaveri and the Krishna and wherever else it was flowing. It's not like that. Our ancestors fought very, very hard to feed themselves and to create surplus. And the only surplus they could create was grain. Because there's just one more or less guaranteed crop. Mm. I was talking to a student of mine, Peter, and this is something that fascinates me nowadays. Uh, the role of climate in food. You know, well, climate is very hot these days. And we're all talking about how it's screwing things up. But it's not only screwing things up. It's actually making some things better. So northern Ladakh was dry, desert. Yeah. You could get one crop in once a year. One crop. 
Mm. Uh, most of the buckwheat in Ladakh came from southern Ladakh, where they managed to get in a second crop because it was not so cold and dry. Now there's global warming. Things are wetter than they were before and warmer than they were before. North, North Ladakh is now growing its own buckwheat. Not amongst things as, you know, a secondary crop, but mm. as a primary crop in its own right. And Kunzus uh, almost uh, was telling me this today, and I was just blown away that you know uh, there is a good side to climate change. You can't beat it, can you? This is the same thing that happened to Europe. Nobody asks you why the Europeans became colonials. Why did the Europeans suddenly decide to pack their bags and go colonizing? It was because of climate change. There was a little ice age in the 15th century. Mm. Uh, it got really cold in Europe, but for some reason, it got better in Sweden. So Sweden had bumper crops. Sweden had very good uh, grain coming in, and Sweden was now rich. And Swedish emperors started going out and conquering outside Sweden. Uh, Gustav Adolf almost turned the whole of Europe Swedish. I mean, if he hadn't been mad enough to lead his own armies into battle and died quite by mistake in 1632, I mean, Swedish would have been the lingua franca of Europe. Mm, okay. And uh, they built the biggest wooden ship ever because they could. They had the money to do so. She was called the Vasa after the Swedish royal dynasty. And she sailed out on her maiden voyage and sank in the harbor because one wave toppled her over. She was too top heavy. She was just too big. Mm. And they actually managed to get her out of the harbor. And there's a beautiful museum. But what I'm trying to say is that you know, climate change is a very funny thing. And it does very funny things. It sent the Europeans abroad. It's allowing uh, the Ladakhis to grow more food. Tell me, I mean, I just, one of the things that, you know, when you, uh, I just want to react to one thing that you said, you know, why don't we call these breads? And I think what, uh, who was talking about it here? Panita Vishwanath has posted that when someone, Priyanka Chopra said this, she got trolled. And I think this thing is, about, I mean, not wanting to use, it's part of that entire, uh, the way of looking at India through a foreign lens, which, or even South India through a North Indian lens and making things. And I think there's a, the resentment pops out of that more than anything else. Parochialism, parochialism, my man. Of having it thrust upon you, you know? There was a time when Indian writing in English uh, explained itself consistently to the West right? No American would write and then, you know, in the middle of it, stop and spend four lines explaining what a hamburger was, right? He or she took it for granted that any reader would know. The Indian writers felt complained to explain a lentil soup or, you know. Rice. Yeah, but you know, uh, if Pound hadn't annotated uh, Elliot, hmm. we would have not known what Elliot was saying most of the time. I still don't. But anyway. I agree with you completely. But you know what I mean? We wouldn't have known anything. So I'm saying, right or wrong, the thing is, if you're having someone else's worldview thrust upon you at the cost of your own, you get resentful. Right? So, you, you know, it's, it, I agree with you. I don't disagree with you. Hmm. But it's when a foreigner says that, you can take umbrage to it. When an Indian starts saying, look, these are all Indian breads, and I'm saying this because I'm talking in English. Hmm. And in English, the word that describes all of these staples is bread. Okay, and then you can't deny it. You might want to deny it. You might desperately feel the need to defend your your identity, your Maybe. culture. But Let me throw something at you, Kuru. See, English is evolving, right? Constantly has. I mean, uh, spaghetti is an Italian word. It is now as English as anything else. And I Pasta. Think Pizza. All of that. Yeah. Now, why cannot? it be that dosa becomes an English word, is I think the point. Uh, two reasons. One, because uh, the era of assimilation is now not what it used to be. So there was a time when Bangla became Banglo and Bajar became Bazaar. And you have Harper's Bazaar and uh, well, it means something completely different. Yeah. But yeah. there's enough words like this. Mm. Uh, there are some Chinese words also offhand. I can't remember them just now, but which are part and parcel of uh, the English language. But that day is gone. 
when English could willy nilly take things from other languages. Today, those languages don't want to give them. Those languages are now in a position where they can assert themselves and they don't want to be dominated by the English speaking peoples. And they have taken English and made English their own. I mean, look at Indian English. And yes, it is Indian English. Indian English is a very different animal. And I think it's a far beautiful animal than American English. American English has gone down the hill. I mean, ever since the days of uh, Pygmalion, when he said they haven't spoken it in America for years, uh, American English today, but at the same time, uh, look at black American English. It is a completely different animal in its own right. And a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. uh, they are asserting their own identity and adapting the language. So uh, you don't really have that choice of having a universal English any longer. The days of universal English has went. Yeah, I'm saying with this in just a tiny example, when I was back when I was in Forbes in uh, Forbes India and editing Forbes Life India, we took a policy decision in our style guide that we will not italicize things like samosa, idli, dosa, biryani, whatever it is, you know, because I mean, like, we will treat them as part of our daily language and not to be explained or italicized. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know whether I'd agree with you that assimilation is no longer there, but I completely agree with you that uh, English as she is formally spoken, the Queen's English, etc., is a concept of the past and best left to the realm of the Queen. And even there, as <laughs> you know, as the as the speech in My Fair Lady went, you know, why can't the English learn to speak English? But <laughs> yeah, but uh, just bringing it back, sort of in a general kind of way, to the archaeological evidence of how has you know past climate change in the subcontinent has that had an effect on okay so subcontinental change is never really there see this is something that we have to understand that change is global mm. there's either very micro level change in mm. a valley along one corner of a coast or things like that or it is across a hemisphere there is no nice uh, india had climate change and everybody else kind of sat around and was cool about it mm. no that doesn't happen so uh, i this is you're going to regret asking me this, Peter. 18,000 years ago, human beings were incredibly happy. There were roughly about 2 million of us on this planet. We were the ultimate killing machines. We worked four to four and a half hours a day. Mm. That's all we needed to work. And if we worked very well on one day, we might not need to work for three days. Because that's what hunting and gathering was all about. If you got a good haul, you were good, right? Mm. So life was very good. And then the Ice Age came to an end. Mm. And as Ice Age doesn't necessarily mean there was snow and ice everywhere, but a certain dry, cold climate existed on the whole planet. Mm. And that radically changed. The ice sheets that covered two-thirds of Northern Europe melted. What do you get when you melt a lot of ice? A lot of water. Every single coastline changed beyond recognition. All our coastlines, which had eroded and become gentle slopes over the preceding hundreds of thousands of years, suddenly became shallow, warm seas. Now, you know, a kilometer or two kilometers doesn't really show up, or five kilometers or 20 kilometers doesn't show up on a global map. So everything looks more or less the same. But just think of it. The whole of Indonesia was one landmass. Mm -hmm. Australia and New Zealand was one. Australia and uh, New Guinea was one landmass. Yeah. Just, just think of that. I mean, the mind boggles. India and Sri Lanka was one landmass, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, suddenly sea levels rose everywhere. The seas were warmer, climate was warmer and it was wetter. So very cold climate actually becomes dry because all your moisture gets locked up in ice. So all of a sudden, vast areas of the Northern hemisphere opened up, which had up to two kilometers of ice on it. You know, I keep telling people Norway, when the ice was released, kind of sprang up by 300 meters because just that much weight went up nowhere. And that's why you have these very deep fjords mm. where uh, ice, you know, icebergs, I have icebergs, I'm saying, uh, glaciers had cut these paths through. And suddenly, when everything went up, you have these quickly, wiggly, wiggly, wiggly lines all over the place. Mm -hmm. So, human beings suddenly had to adapt to this. Now, 
it was originally a fabulous adaptation because the forests were more forestier, the grasslands were grassier and all of that. And there was abundance of fruit, vegetable, animal. Hallelujah, brothers and sisters, we've seen the light. But, but, you see, we hadn't read Darwin. I mean, the fact that Darwin hadn't yet written what he was going to write and hadn't been born is a separate issue. Uh, Darwin's biggest thing actually was not evolution. It was not survival of the fittest. It was about the carrying capacity of the land. And very few people realize this. So, I mean, others had already said it before Darwin. It's not like Darwin was, but Darwin was really harping about this. He was basically saying what Bai said on Channel V. Itna paisa mein itna ich milega. If you got this much fruit, this much vegetable, you are only going to get this much out of it and no more. Before this, because we were semi-nomadic to nomadic, we practiced a very simple thing of having one child in arms, which meant that if we had more than one child in arms, that child got left behind because mother and both children were at risk. A newborn child was the most expendable. The mother was the least expendable. She could have more children and she was a providing member, a contributing member of the tribe. Populations were kept in check. Suddenly, we could stay in one place and eat, 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 which meant that we didn't need to move, which meant that we could have more than one child who was being weaned simultaneously. It meant that the population went crazy. Now, there are other factors. I'm making this very short. I mean, I could go on on this for two hours. But all of a sudden, people realized the food was running out. So strong groups pushed weak groups into semi-arid regions. Every single place in the world, farming starts in the semi-arid regions. Nowhere does it start in the Ganga Valley. Farming does not start in the valleys of the Indus and the Saraswati. It starts in the headwaters. It starts in the Deccan Plateau. Why? Because these poor buggers were forced to grow their own food, plant and animal to survive. And what is it that you can plant once and live off it the entire year, which you can store? Grain, nothing but grain. And grain itself was something that was really evolving with us at this time, because the steppe was making it possible for there to be massive grass pants. So one direction, of course, was nomadic pastoralism. But nomadic pastoralism, as Khazana has said very clearly, is an evolutionary dead end. The only exception to nomadic pastoralism being an evolutionary dead end is the Mongols. And there are other extraneous factors over there for the Mongols actually creating a nation state. The Scythians tried before that, but it doesn't really work till you settle down. You have to settle down. And the Mongol Empire ultimately died because of that, you know, because they refused to have permanent cities. And by the time they did, it was way too late. So climate change made us what we are today. Climate change made us farmers. Climate change gave us the diet that we have today. We would have been far healthier. We were terribly healthy 18,000 years ago. And then we were horribly unhealthy for the last 16,000 years. It's only in the last 2,000 years that we're getting healthier and healthier. And actually the last 200 years in India, and even less, Look at it, uh, Peter, if you look at it, almost all of us, men especially, if you look at, I'm being very sexist here, are taller than our fathers. Who were taller than their fathers? Yes. Marginally, maybe. Yes. Inch here, two inches there. Why? It's not because our genes are better or we are evolving. It's purely because we have better nutrition. We have better access to medicine. We do, Our growth isn't stunted as children. So all of these things, you know, and... Um, Climate change made it possible. Now climate change is probably going to change back. It does these. There are these little ice ages. There was one uh, just before the Mughals. There was one around 1400 BC, which brought about an end ultimately to all the Bronze Age populations. There was one that resulted, like I said, in the 15th century, which uh, drove the Europeans out of Europe and made them colonizers. Mm. Girls are taller too. Yes, I know. Actually, I'm just being very pointed here about Peter and giving the example to Peter so that he can identify and I can identify and we can kind of say that this is the case. Yes, girls are getting taller, but think of it, glasses. Now I got my glasses about four or five years ago for reading. 
and progressively it will get worse and worse. Uh, if you were born with glasses, uh, just just think of it in your grandfather's generation. How many people were, wore glasses when they were very young? Very few of them. And before that, even fewer because glasses were rare. No, because if you had bad eyesight, you rarely ever got a chance to procreate. We weeded these genes out because there were no glasses. Yep. We can allow these genes to now exist because there are glasses. Similarly for the hearing impaired, similarly for the handicapped, so on and so forth. I mean, with the kind of accident I had when I was 19, I should have been bedridden, I should have been dead or I should have been bedridden for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Medicine allowed me to stand up and go on with my life and be an archaeologist, caterer, culinary anthropologist, etc. So all of these factors, you know, and we don't factor this in to food. We don't factor in the things that women have been tied, have been shackled to the drudgery of home. Making babies, taking care of home and cooking. And I actually talk of them as three different verticals. And look at how women have had the time that they have now because of appliances. You know, the masala, the masala mashpata, you know, and the drudgery of that taken away by the mixer grinder. The washing machine has freed two hours a day if, of most women. Two hours. Just think of what that is every year. That's more than 7,000 hours a year. Sorry, uh, 700 hours a year, which is saved just because there's the washing machine in the house. How can you put a price on it? Refrigeration, which means you don't have to cook three meals a day every single day. You can cook once and put it in the damn freezer and then bung it in the microwave to heat it. And the whole ready mix masala powder. Yeah. People keep talking about that's not authentic anymore. And, all that. and when I look at the label, kiss my, kiss my fat patootie. Okay. okay. We've had these discussions before on this kind of thing of so much that people, I mean, the people who are wanting the authentic are not actually going and doing the work that goes into that traditional authentic stuff. And look, the way we eat and all that has to change. I mean, and I keep, uh, I remember this, there was a discussion had online many, many years ago about things like lassi and you should have it with this much cream. And I'm like, Baba, if like your great grandfather, you were working in the fields of Punjab at blistering heat in summer and freezing cold in winter and melting it all away, do that. But if you're sitting in your office in Gurgaon and putting down that much lassi, Baba, you're on the road to heart attack. Why do? Why are we the diabetes capital of the world? Yeah. And soon we will be the cardio issue capital of the world because we haven't learned to adapt our food habits to our sedentism. Absolutely. Just think of it, uh, Peter. Peter, I worked in Rajasthan, where almost every single male consumes opium in the winter if they are farming. So you make opium water; it's called amal, and you drink about you know a decent dish peg of it in the morning because you're going to work up to your knees in freezing cold water early in the morning to divert water in your fields and to water your fields and to plow your fields and so on and so forth in winter. Otherwise, you can't put in a winter crop. And it's impossible to work without this. There are no gumboots and no gumboots are good enough to last. You know? And again, food. So uh, the sambars of uh, that region where I worked stopped doing what they were doing. They stopped skinning carcasses. They said, you look down at us because we skin these carcasses and we work with leather. So we are all going to become vegetarian. So there. And we're now going to cremate our dead. We're not burying them any longer. So there. And this is caste upliftment for us. Uh, you would have said bugger if they don't want to do it, right? But what the damage they were doing to the village economy by making this choice was gargantuan. So the Rajput heads of five villages came together and said, guys, we are up shit creek without a paddle because we were getting something for that dead animal, which we are not A. They were taking away the dead animal and disposing it off, which they are not B. And C, even more important was that they were providing continuous servicing to all leather items. And leather is a huge part of the food business in the village agrarian system. So they went out 20 kilometers and they imported a chambar. Okay, a chamar. They imported, so they're called megwals over there. So they imported this megwal. They put up a house for him. They gave him a plot in the village. And he's untouchable, okay? Right. 
really low caste, terrible, terrible. So they, they do all this for him. They make a deal with him. He has exclusive rights to every single dead animal in this many villages. Plus, every single family gives him one measure. So it's a large measure of corn per individual in the family. Now, you know what this measure of corn is for? This is exactly what allowed craft specialization to take place in the Bronze Age. See, if I start working leather, who's going to grow food to feed my family, right? So you're going to feed me in exchange. And it was beautiful to see the system in place. The system was organic. They said every single family for every individual in the village, irrespective of he's a newborn baby or he's an old man who's about to die, will give you one measure of corn in return for which you will repair anything in leather for free. Hmm. You understand? Yeah. So apart from waiting for the occasional animal to die and taking the skin away hmm. and paying a certain premium to the person whose skin you were taking away, and by being the only family, instead of 40 families, you suddenly had more leather than you knew what to do with. But it's still not something that happens every day. But repairs happen every day. And you don't have to worry about grain at all. Mm. So uh, there was major caste upliftment. So much so that within two years, this man was edging towards being very nouveau-riche. And he had a motorcycle. It was the first motorcycle in the village. Then he had a television set. Mm. It was the only television set in the village for, I think, eight or nine years. So you know what he did? He enlarged his front door. Now, all the kids in the village would want to watch television, but they can't cross his doorway because he's untouchable and they can't go to his house. So he enlarged his doorway, put up his television so you could see it from outside his doorway. His family would loll in the hall as such, which is basically just two rooms in the house, and watch television while the village, the entire village's children would be packed into a row neatly facing his front door, watching the telly. Mm -hmm. uh, what was happening? Very quiet interaction and interrelation between all those kids was happening. In two generations, we will wipe out caste in that village to an enormous extent without making any more effort. Just think of it. It's all about food. Yeah, the food... Uh... And caste thing is particularly fraught. And I've had these discussions as well. You know, the thing about what is... Uh, Kirtana was on my first chat, was talking about that and the entire thing, that the way that all parts of an animal are used. We, uh, we've talked about this in the context of what is taboo and what is not in various places. Things that are particularly intrinsic, the whole curd rice thing, which you will find only in uh, popular and natural and beloved by people who are of the so-called higher castes because the people in the so-called lower castes were not getting any of that tick. They were not they, getting any milk. They were, you know, at most a little bit of buttermilk here and there, that kind of thing. Yeah. So the curd rice is not, not happening. You know, intrinsically South Indian, a lot of people who from that area don't get to eat curd rice. Yeah. Have you noticed something about diasporic food? If you go to South Asia, Indian food is usually Tamilian food. And it's vegetarian Tamilian food in South in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia. All over, you go mm -hmm. to Southeast Asia, it's all basically Tambram food. Yeah. You go to North America, it's basically all Punjabi food, but it's vegetarian. Yeah. And you go to England, and it's this thing called Indian food, which it's is owned by Punjabis, run by Bangladeshis, and it is all chicken. Yeah. And the, some of those recipes, I swear to you, Peter, there were days when I wanted to stab myself and come in harakiri with a blunt teaspoon. Uh, so I'm talking to this young man in, on my excavations in Sanjan. And he's a cook in Birmingham. Mm. And he's come back after three years to meet his mom. And he's surprised to find that there's this excavation going on. And he's now a man of the world. And he bored to tears in his little village, poor guy. So he comes and spends afternoons with me. So he's telling me about how he was a chef over there. And you know how he's in this Indian restaurant. And 
wow, really nice, you know. So I said, I'd love to eat some of the food that you cook over there. And he said, no, you will not eat the food that I cook over there. And thank God for my mother. She won't let me cook in her kitchen. Mm. So I was like, I'm a Muslim guy. Why would your mother not let you cook in the kitchen? Because she wants to feed me while I'm here. I've tried trying to feed her. It doesn't work. I was like, damn. And he says, no, you won't be able to eat what I'm giving you. I was like, no, um, I've tried all kinds of things. I'm open to how much can you de-Indianize Indian food, right? So this is your Parsi, right? You eat Dansak. So yes. So what goes in as the main thickener in the dal? I said, pumpkins, brinjal, spring onions. And he says, uh, you know what we use in uh, Birmingham? I'm like, no. Tinned pineapples. And I'm like, tinned pineapples? Yeah. And he's saying like, you know, so I decided one day to make Dansak. It's a very popular thing on Wednesdays or Thursdays or some day like that is the special. I decided to make the traditional way. Everybody sent it back and said it was foul. They only want it with pineapple. My boss asked me whether I wanted it to be fired. And what in God's name was wrong with me? Yeah. So I said, okay, maybe I really don't want to taste this now, somehow dhansak with tin pineapples. <laughs> I'm normally a eat and let eat kind of guy, but this sounded like trauma mm-hmm. to a good Parsi boy who makes dhansak. I mean, that's the entire thing of what is comfort food as well. And comfort food is so much, it's your culture. It's what you've grown up with. I mean, my cult, my comfort food is Kaswe because I happen to have folks who came in from Burma, Burma. my family. And that was the dish that was a special when we went to visit my grandparents. It was one of the things my aunt would cook each time. And uh, I share this only with some uh, certain amount of people from the, that, you know, Calcutta, Bangladesh, and the Surat. other. Surat. Okay. Houseway is a very big thing in Surat because lots of Gujaratis came from came back from Bangladesh, uh, from yes, Burma yes, also. Yes, yes, someone told me about this as well. I'm sorry, I did forget that. Someone did tell me about this as well. And it's a vegetarian house where it's Surat, by the way. Yes, yes. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. I wanted to do just before, I, I do also want to talk about what uh, what this entire COVID time has meant to the catering business and the food business. And we have talked about it in you know, a few, few sessions with the people I know from the food business, for people who do this. But I did want to just spend a little time, Karish, on you mentioned Deccan College as where you did your uh, master's, right? And that is pretty much the hub of uh, archaeology in India, even now? You uh, so, okay, alma mater, uh, you know, we build our school on the hand to chest and all that. Um, it's still the, the institution in many ways. It has the most fabulous library as far as archaeology is concerned. It has some of the most amazing laboratories in archaeology but it is no longer the place Mm. in the sense that there are a lot of young upstart places, some not so young like MS University Baroda, which have made their own inroads, established their own Jagir. There are young Turks today like Kerala University, which are doing some fabulous work. Uh, There are universities uh, who are older universities who've revamped their departments. And a lot of universities are now, you know, dabbling with archeology span as a paper or two papers in their Indology departments, in the history departments. So it's not as simple as it was before, but Deccan College is still one of the places that you want to visit, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of like Oxford. You know, today, nobody really goes on and on about going to Oxford for a degree. Mm. But you know, when you say Oxford, you're like, hmm, Oxford. That was your alma mater, right? Hmm. So yeah, when I say I did my master's and my PhD from Deccan College, uh, there is a certain amount of gravity to that. Hmm. Uh, will there be gravity for students 20 years down the line? I don't know. Deccan hmm. College has been through a bad bit. But all institutions have that as part of their lives. There are ups, there are downs. Hmm. You know, too much Peter in India is all about the individual. So individuals actually build institutions, fair enough. But 
institutions should not be built continuous to exist on the shoulders of individuals this load must be divided if mm. we want to grow we can't grow if we are individual jagis any longer so in india if i don't get along with you and we are in the same department we won't work together uh, in america i might hate you you might be suing the pants of me but we will work together if we are in the same department because that is the job and whatever our personal animosity might be it's got nothing to do with showing up you know for the team and taking one for the team mm. i'll give you an example i remember my guide uh, professor vn mishra telling me that he was in the usa and uh, one of the biggest departments at that time with a great uh, uh, clark was uh, at that time uh, heading the department and he'd been incredibly busy the last year before that so they were having the annual budget session all the money that had been come in was now being given out and everybody you know somebody said i'd like this much money for this project that much other and he got up and said you know last year i published nothing because i was just working admin to put things together so i will take nothing for my work this year and first do some work before i put my hands into the common kitty and mishra ji said i came back home to pune and i realized that this would never happen in india it would never be that the head of a department in india would say i won't take my fair share and it won't be the largest share and that is still sadly the case mm-hmm. which is why you know unless there is a massive visionary in a department he can't bootstrap it into the next phase uh deccan college had hd sakalya so you know even though he retired before everything came to fruition he had set it in motion after he's been gone we've done very little new mm. and there have been a lot of disciplines that have come up some disciplines in archaeology which don't really have their fair representation at deccan college just because you know this is not in my jagir and i will not trade any space of mine or funds of mine to help you so that happens also people in the same department don't talk to each other don't share data with each other won't work together and archaeology is a team game you can't be solo i keep telling people that you know people who publish cons- consistently alone okay there is something wrong either they are amateur theoreticians which is fair enough then hmm. or they are riding on other people's shoulders without giving due credit and how does it kill you to give people credit i remember i wrote a paper with uh, nine co-authors it was one of my preliminary reports of my excavation people were coming to work with me my first excavation and i had nothing to offer them you know i had no institution nothing the only thing i could offer them was a publication and i felt that that would be something that would set set people off you know and make them want to do more and they did i've had people who come back to me years later and said you know i saw my name in print for the first time thanks to you and the thrill of that even today after 20 papers being published nationally and internationally i still think of that day thank you and that's my uh, currency mm-hmm. those are my dividends so i don't see why you can't share and then i realize why you can't share because indian academia now has this point system which says that if you're a solo author you get x number of points for the article if you are two authors the first author gets some 70% or 60% of the points and the second author gets 40% of the points why how do you decide who's first author or second author and if there are more than two authors and the first author gets some 30% and then everybody else gets some 5% after that or some shit like that or divided amongst everybody which is ridiculous come with me and i'll show you cutting edge science articles there will very often be 30 40 50 authors for a four page article i have an article in genome biology thanks to my data from sanjan being some of the first material in the country from which we could extract ancient dna and uh, i'm completely shameless about saying i love that article because the kind of uh, publicity that i get for that article i would have never got in archaeology article mm-hmm. but uh, and i would have never got published in genome biology for god's sake i know a lot of geneticists who don't get published there 
there are 32 people in that article. I'm somewhere in the middle. There are 32 people because those are all the people who worked on various things in this. The corresponding author is the last author, not the first one. That's the way academia is done outside the country, mm. not in India. So when government policy goes against making academia more comfortable, then this is what happens. And everybody's running after these API points. I'm happy I'm also the university because within the university, with that dead end job, I had so many points, it wasn't funny. I could technically apply to be a professor anywhere in the country. I had that many points amassed. And what were they doing for me? So Vikas says in the US, eight to nine authors per paper. The first few authors are the ones that did the work. The last authors often the sponsor or the person who paid the money to get it done. Yeah. And why not? That's what makes more people come to give money to people to do work. So in the last you know, few years, you know, thanks to starting to read Tony Joseph's book uh, and I started looking up papers and I'm finding them very hard to penetrate. All right. But I would just look, that started me off searching for stuff. And I would see papers with like, as you said, 20, 30, 40 names because the research was drawing from so much and, you know, so many people contributing to it and the citations, I mean, from a non-academic point of view, it was a bit painful to read and not even including academic style, which somehow tends to be one of the requirements. It's horribly boring. Tends to be like, how can we make this more boring? <laughs> you know? But I mean, the reason why Tony... Well, it's very true. But there is a reason for this. So, how, yeah. Why do we make it boring? Do you know what the reason is? Tell me. The reason is that you've got to say the maximum possible things in the minimum possible words because there is no money in publishing academia. So when you are published, you're not paying to be published. People are actually paying to publish your work, even if they aren't paying you directly, right? Mm. So uh, if you read some Mortimer Wheeler's autobiography, he talks about his father who was an English vicar, telling him specifically that when you write, think that every word is costing somebody money to publish. So you must use as few words as possible to say as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And that is why academic writing is heinously boring. Yeah. Heinously boring. My greatest compliment from my wife, who, by the way, writes beautifully, was when I wrote my first paper and I gave it to her to read. She said, it reads like your guide wrote it. It's horrendously dry and boring. And I said, hallelujah. Take that one off. You know, because that was like, good. So yeah, it is. And I've subsequently tried to write more simply. But... Uh, As someone saying in the comments, and I'm not going to uh, reveal the name since they sent it only to host and panelists. My clients in India want to be second authors for a piece of work they didn't do. Oh, that, that, are Baba. Every <laughs> single guide in North India, and I'm saying this, okay, so there will be exceptions to the rule, but virtually every single guide in North India insists that their PhD students include their names in their articles, which are written from, which are carved off from the PhD. So most PhD students, you know, get three or four articles out of their PhD. The guide wants to be in on every single one of them. Yeah. And there are no two ways about it. Okay, if you don't want to commit academic harakiri, you will do it. You will do research. I know somebody who wrote an entire thesis for guide's child who did two PhDs so that that person's PhD got signed off on. Yes. Okay, that bad. Uh -huh. I know guides who very categorically tell you that, huh, you have DST project, no? So how much is your, uh, so you get an annual stipend in your DS, in your projects, UGC or DST, which are called, uh, I forget what the word is just now, but this is towards your incidental expenses, stationery, Xerox, buying some books, some equipment, stuff like that. So that has to be withdrawn and given to your guide. So your guide can use it for their research in cash. Mm. Totally, it's, it's taken for granted. I was like, what do you mean by taken for granted? So he says, you know, my wife is doing a PhD and her guide made it very clear that you haven't set, submitted your money to me in an envelope. Why haven't you? And she was aghast. She had to take a loan from her father because she'd spent that money righteously on 
stuff that she was supposed yes, to do. Really. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, this is what happens. And uh, yeah, so people wanting. So I know somebody who actually wrote, who decided to get out of academia and wrote four articles with their guide. Every single article was horrendously plagiarized. You know who lost the job? The guide. Ah, this is what happens when you want your name Fukat on articles. I'll write articles. You'll get them published. No, you have the pull to get them published. No? You get them published. Then one of these days, I'll tell people where those articles are plagiarized. I'm out of it in any case. You are going down hard after 30 years in the field. You know what it means, Peter? When after 30 years, five of your articles are massively plagiarized, every single one of your articles, every single bit of work that you've done in your life, was you under scrutiny. That, yeah. And see, it does happen that sometimes you might forget one stray reference or the other. Yes. It's only human. I remember somebody being accused of plagiarism who wrote an overview of 200 years of research in a subfield. And there were some 27 pages of references at the end of the book. 27 or 37 pages of references. Two references by one author were missing. So that person was accused of plagiarization. And that person said, you know, I've got so many bloody people down. Why would I miss this person? I mean, why? Genuine mistake, boss. And everybody laughed at it and said, come on, man. Mm. And there are some genuine problems that happen. I remember a case where two groups of people were working on the same thing. And before internet was really happening, just internet just started. One group had submitted their work. Publication was taking time, which it used to in those days. It often took a year, two years for your articles to see light of day. Other group who started working after them got the article published first. And when the first group's article came out, they said, you plagiarized the article. And these guys had to go through and get uh, letters, this, that, and the other to prove that, hey, we had submitted this one and a half years ago. We're sorry it didn't get published. And it got published now. Mm. All hell broke loose. People almost lost their jobs in my, my college for this. So this happens. Yeah. This happens very commonly. We had the head of the ICHR who was appointed by uh, <clears throat> our current uh, political masters who didn't have any articles we're talking about as the head of the Indian Council for Historical Research. He said, I have a blog. One of the nicest VCs I knew, and I'm saying this, one of the nicest VCs, this is comparative, at the Bombay University that I knew in my 10 years there, okay, had one academic article to his credit. Mm -hmm. One. Singularis. And some five or six problems as they're called in statistics. Mm -hmm. Okay, problem solutions as they're called. I remember one of my friends from America coming down and telling me, Guru, you've got at that time, I had about 25 odd peer reviewed publications. You got 25 publications. You're 25 times more qualified than your VC for this job. I said, no, no, that's not the qualification. The qualification is uh, A, administrative and B, who you know politically. But yeah, that's, that's how we make a mockery out of things. Peter, who goes to a university in India and boasts about it today abroad? Mm. Who comes from abroad to an Indian university unless they're desperate? Yeah, we have we have completely mothered. Uh, uh, Deepak Malani says the word is contingency grant. Yes, that's what that term is. Thank you, Deepak, for that. So no, this is this is something that our system is fraught with. The reason at the India Study Center Trust, when we started a diploma, the first question we were asked with was, "Who's your affiliation with?" And we said nobody. Nobody. We don't think we need affiliation with anybody. We've been through the University Grants Commission requirements. There is nothing that says that you cannot start a diploma. Nothing. Mm. Diplomas and certificate courses can be started by anybody. You cannot start a degree yeah. unless you are recognized by the University Grants Commission. So we're not starting a degree. We have a diploma course in archaeology. By the way, guys, mine starts on the 22nd. I think Peter's put it up. Uh, we have a really fun time doing archaeology on Saturdays. 7 to 9 p.m. Shamelessly plugging Peter. And uh, we do a, I do a lot of separate courses on the studying, called the studying food courses. Mm. So we do a studying food workshop. We've done eight iterations of it, six of them online since the lockdown. 
uh, we now have an online community of about 300 odd people who've passed out through our doors. We've done special workshops on politics and food, on diasporic food, on studying Desi Daru, all kinds of things. And we've realized that there is a world of things to study and record in India, which we are losing at a rapid pace. It's not just our archeology span or our intangible heritage. And food is an intangible heritage. The UNESCO commission actually says so, that food is an intangible heritage. You know, there are there is only one qualified food historian in Bombay, and that's not me, okay? That's Dr. Mosina Mukadam. She is the only historian with a PhD in food that I know of in the whole of Mumbai. Imagine that. Must introduce her to me. Yeah, sure, happily. Uh, and she retires this year from Ruya College. The only two other people that I consider really food historians, one of them is your good friend Vikram Doctor, who is fabulous. And the other is Pushpesh Pant from Delhi. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's now just so irritated at most people writing about food, it's not funny. And I can understand it, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And people asking you for free bites and free quotes and free help, it happens. I've even edited three chapters of somebody's book recently. And being told, hey, but that book you could have written better or some shit like that, which is nonsense. Every author has the right to write the book that they want to write it. And I'm sure it's a fabulous book. In fact, I'm hoping to get my own copy. I wasn't there in time to get it. But what I'm saying is, uh, why can't you help people? But at some point, you know, you get older and crankier and you don't have the time. And people take you for granted. It happens. I get the most bizarre queries from people who don't even give me their names. It's on WhatsApp, on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. Sir, I want to know about this. Will you tell me? Want to know about this? Will you tell me? Who are you? Who are you? Somebody who's probably called the, the Maroon Multiple Goblin or something like that is your handle. How do I know who you are and why you want to know this? Yeah, entitlement. So fully. Full yeah. entitlement. Then one, one, somebody today, just today, uh, just before we logged on, somebody was a nutritionist, put up a thing. If you have COVID and you need some diet advice, DM me, I'm open. One of her next tweets was, Please be sensible and sensitive because people are asking her for weight loss advice on DMs. <laughs> Someone's being nice and offering you expertise for free for a specific thing you think you can pile on. Yeah, but why do you think that, can you go to a doctor and ask them for free uh, medical consultation? No, no, you don't do that, no? So why do you go to a historian and ask for something free? Why do you go to an archaeologist? Because that poor guy also knows that nobody's going to pay for it. Which is also true, no? I have stopped lecturing online without being paid for it. I've told people I don't care what you pay me, but you have to pay me on principle. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have got damn upset about it. Oh, he's only average. He just wants money. I said, yes, I think I'm worth something. And if you want me to come and teach at your university, at your college, at your department, or even for your company, I damn well expect to be compensated for my time. No, we'll give you free publicity. Don't need your exposure, 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 exposure yeah. is the other word. Exposure, yeah. I mean, I've heard so much of that in my career and my various careers. Would you like to do a collab with me? A collab? No, I don't want to do a collab with you. That's you because you're an Instagram influencer. I thankfully have like some handful of Instagram followers. I'm not an influencer, I don't even have 10,000 followers. I'm happy where I am, Peter. My followers are organic and they're real. I haven't bought a single follower in my life, okay. And I know people who have it, it's obvious because. When about 90% of your followers are from Ukraine and Estonia and Burkina Faso, and you're an expert in Indian food, then I'm really worried. Yeah, man, I'm like a friend of mine who's who works at the sort of intersection of, you know, uh, public, she's not in public relations, but she is dealing with people who work in public relations and a client. And she was telling me about yeah, okay, so the person has promised us this for influencers and things, and I'm like, the budgets for that. I mean, it's just taken for granted that there is a budget for which is lax ah. for influencers. And I'm like, I have completely had the wrong priorities in my life. Why okay. did I try to become a good writer? If Virat Kohli supposedly tweets for you, it's a couple of crores and more. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah, Virat's a lovely man and a fantastic player and all of that. 
but really would i want to buy the cola that he drinks or i don't know the sabji that he drinks eats or uh, the mattress that he sleeps on i mean really is that what floats my boat no no you know somebody has written away india has become a paper pump for assistant uh, assistant professors from abroad to come and increase their profile count i'll tell you what i work with one uh, associate professor from yale and us which is the national university of singapore's yale campus he almost begged me not to include his name in the article saying i didn't do much i said if it hadn't been your idea i wouldn't have been doing this so he's one of seven authors okay yeah because all my team who works with me in the field are my authors tough and you can like it you can not like it you don't have to like it i don't care but uh, what i'm trying to say is everybody doesn't do this there are good people everywhere do you know in between they exposed this fact that you could pay and get yourself published online and how some 90% of the online uh, uh, journals were basically just places where you could buy api points Thirty mm. plus percent were Indian authors. Thirty yeah. plus percent of a global database was made up of Indian authors. I am so grateful that I have never paid a single paisa. But I've been told, sir, you will have to send a check of twelve hundred rupees because there will be incidental expenses. Like no boss, I have never taken a single paisa of money from people when I have published the work, and I have never paid. So tough. Yeah. this is as good as get some institutions like the asian society have actually paid me for writing articles the enormous sum of 600 rupees for a published article it's very sweet of them i normally try to make sure that i donate it back to them or something like that sometimes i just forget a couple of times once i think i forgot to even submit my check to my bank but yeah that happens but uh, yeah you know it's it's crazy yeah it is and sometimes i you get paid for stuff which you actually think you're doing for free and it's such a pleasant i did i went to for a friend of mine went to tiss to talk about journalism and then shortly after the a check arrived with a thank you and what is check but it wasn't expected you know and it's so sweet when people value your time with whatever so there are places that i go to lecture where i know that they have a policy of paying people but i don't ask them what they're going to pay me because i know that they respect me enough not to behave like that to expect me to work for free yeah. i do stuff for schools peter even today free because i really believe that schools really need help and if a school invites me i'll lecture free that's my thing okay and uh, i worked at the cms with dr mukda karnik and she was all gangho to send me out so she'd be manic about me being at work even if i had nothing to do at work okay because it was the right thing to do which is to drive me not set types i've told her this this is a regular thing that we had but if i said i have a lecture at don bosco school in wadala she said don't come to work today go go yeah. i'll be like no i'll make it back to work you know my like coffee time or whatever no 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 don't worry yeah. so yeah because you care yeah. but uh, if uh, uh, but if some international school called me after the first time i would expect to be paid yeah. because if you can charge your kids 15 lakhs a year honey you can afford to pay me and i'm not asking for a 10000 rupees per lecture or something i'm not even asking for 5000 rupees per lecture for god's sake but kuch to some token i have even told one uh, uh, university we said we can't afford to pay you I said give me 101 i have very close friends of mine at a college in bombay a uh, very very prestigious college southish bombay and they're lovely people and they have lovely students i have told them very categorically that if you don't pay me i'll still come to teach because they used to pay me 60 rupees an hour i was like you're going to give me 90 bucks for a one and a half hour lecture i just drove down from khargar i spent 400 bucks worth of petrol don't pay me they said no we have to pay you i said this i understand because if we don't pay you and we don't have your signature on this there is no proof that you came <laughs> so if you don't take our money we can't prove that you came and we are we are up shit creek without a battle <laughs> Also, visiting faculty are treated like shit. Yeah. I completely agree with you, Vanita. Visiting faculty are treated like shit. At some point, see people like me who got an alternate source of income. We put our foot down and we say, "Pass." Uh, again, I give you a food quote for this. Uh, many many years ago, there was a beautiful advertising campaign for a brand of tea. It was a brand of tea of Darjeeling tea from Sikkim, and it had a 
I guess I think it was Sikkim, and it had a beautiful Tibetan monk on it, and a tea garden in the background, and the tea was called Rangli Rangliyo, which in Tibetan supposedly has a specific. It's a specific term. So this monk had set out in search for the best tea in the world, and then when he came to this one little garden in the middle of nowhere, and he drank the tea, he said the famous words Rangli Rangliyo, this far and no further. I have never forgotten the tea caddy and the story on the back. But uh, yes, thanks to the fact that I had alternative sources of income, I've been able to tell people, bus boss, ek time free me karega. Uske baad nahi karega. So call me only once. I made the mistake of doing this with a television channel who asked me to do a show for them. I became very good friends with the person who did the show and we've done much more work after that. And uh, they called me once, they called me twice, they called me thrice. I said, three strikes and you're out guys. So then they called me in and worked with me for an entire pitch for an entire season. And at the end of it, uh, they forgot about me and they went ahead with the season. Hmm. Now, if I work with a television channel, I want a contract. Yeah. With the exception of the lady I did the first job with. Because I've told her, if you call me, you have to pay me. So I've actually had her production team saying, look, sir, we're very sorry. ATM is not working. It's two o'clock in the morning. We can't pay you just now. We'll pay you tomorrow, sir. I'm like, okay, okay, cool, cool. Relax. It's okay. You can pay me tomorrow. <laughs> it's not that bad. No, madam said, if you don't pay you today, you'll never come to work again with us. So, yeah, you, you make, you cut slack, Peter, when you know people and you have a personal relationship. Yes, Anita, 60 rupees an hour. This was less than 10 years ago. Luckily, the university norms have caught up. By the way, when I joined the uh, department at the university, we were paying 300 rupees an hour. And that was the highest possible rate to pay. Yeah. Mukda Karnik unilaterally made it 500 rupees an hour. There was uproar all over the university accounts department that now every department will want this. How you can do like this? So she said, bugger yourself. Go and have a look at the university rules which say, uh, University Grants Commission says 1000 rupees an hour. Mm. At the moment, from all the people that I know in India who pay, studying food pays more per hour than anybody else. We take great pride in that. My back office team, which consists of one whole person, makes sure that before you finish your lecture, your phone has already got ding ding and your money is already in your account. And this is just because she's incredibly hardworking. I'm the lazy bum. But thanks to that, I've got some amazingly good publicity. That, Ari, you should you should lecture at studying food because they pay promptly. And I found out from friends of mine like Kalyan Karmakar, I can name him because uh, I know him well enough, that there are enough people who don't pay him. Yeah. Hindustan Lever owes me 25,000 rupees for the last two and a half years. Hindustan Lever. Mm. International team comes down, they ask me to come over. I quote what I thought was an incredibly reasonable price. They immediately agree. They send down a vehicle for me. It's pouring rain. Trains are being cancelled in Bombay. I insist on going because I've made a commitment. Go there, do the presentation, finish the presentation. Everybody's thrilled to bits. They're very happy. I leave. And uh, I wait and wait and wait. And I have 500 emails with their uh, department. And I finally gave up. So I'll never work with Hindustan Lever or Unilever again. Yeah. It's for that. And no, Pratibha, I don't want a memento if I'm doing a failure because that's just going to be things that I have to carry back home. And that memento <laughs> thing, we are going to give you a memento. I normally throw it away. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I actually had one memento which I didn't throw away because it was the most hideous thing ever given to me. And it was given to me by a very nice group of people and an art teacher in a small college in deep Maharashtra, rural Maharashtra. It was Horrendous. It was hideous. Its mother couldn't have loved it. But I kept it for many years till it fell off the shelf. Mm. But yeah, this, this, this memento thing. Don Bosco gave me a beautiful cube of acrylic with Don Bosco's face inside it in 3D. And how is that quite going to do anything for me? I don't know. It seems some of that stuff that comes in seems that not only do they are they taking this stuff for free? They think that you are going to put this up somewhere and give them a, effectively a free advertising space yeah. <laughs> for their stuff. Because why would I want to? I mean, 
completely completely why and most of these plaques and things like that are hideous yeah. same yeah exactly when it appears to i mean but i'm rabid about i i don't like that flowers i i like to grow them but yeah uh, but kush i just want before we throw it completely open to audience and folks and people who will be invited to join the panel like ragu and arzu and you had mentioned a couple of others but ah uh, yes i will invite them in but uh we were talking before we let in the audience about how the catering business and how it's been through this lockdown there's been the ups and downs of uh i mean people thought that you know take out and all that would be doing well but obviously it's been a very difficult time we've talked to i've spoken to people in the food business over this time and i will be speaking to more including businesses that have shut down etc but how has it been running a catering business through these last so the catering business is everywhere the food business is everywhere mm-hmm. unless there are these mega i don't know zaibatsu kind of thingies okay have been in the doldrums for the last 7 or 8 years uh first we got hit by demonetization things had already been bad because you know there was the whole world slump this that and the other and it always hits the economy and it always hits celebrations but that was stuff that you could you know those were punches that you could roll with then demonetization happened and everybody said it's such a good thing that it happened uh demonetization meant that people and i'm sorry to say this had to pay taxes if they wanted to pay by check and nobody wants to pay taxes i don't blame people for not wanting to pay taxes but i got no choice right i'm not going to pay your your taxes so that was a problem plus demonetization just took money out of the system and people had no liquidity at all so demonetization was a huge blow lots of our vendors just went under you know people who had 90 day payment schedules and things like that just just died because there was no money to pay them people who daily wages didn't know what to do you know we hire daily wages when we are doing uh, weddings and you know big functions and things like that how do i pay you if there's no cash in the system and you live on day to day jobs so it was horrendous we were recovering from that when we got hit by gst now i'm a great fan of gst i think gst is a fantastic thing but gst has to be implemented with thought we implemented gst with absolutely no thought we had no idea about what rates should be what collections should be what system should be in place nothing everybody wanted me to absorb gst in my costs how do i absorb 18% do i have an 18% margin in food at the end of the day if my profit profit after taxes is 18% that's impossible peter what am i selling at that so everybody is either if they in, including it ramping up their base price and saying it's all inclusive or are telling you to pay it people don't want to pay it so that has been a huge problem so on the whole things were bad throughout till 2018 2019 there was a major pick up in the market i won't deny that and i'm not going to blame anybody for it or praise anybody for it this was the market 2019 was a good year a lot of people came back from where they were you know uh i had a good october finally i had a good november i had a really good december and on the 2nd of january i paid my staff for the first time before the 15th of the month my staff was in shock on the 1st of february i paid my staff again on the 1st itself they thought something was very wrong we had a mind blowing january in 2020 super february and we were looking at a kick ass march because 2021 22 20, was the weekend and it was jamshedi nowruz and we had a fixed menu everything in place friday was phenomenal saturday was very good bookings but sunday i had enough bookings to start worrying peter about what am i going to do will i be able to get all the food out on time stuff like that so i had all my suppliers send me stuff on saturday morning and then we declared a lockdown from sunday morning so i called up all my clients and said i'm really sorry but no food on sunday so we luckily in those days we were all uh, pay on receipt of food so we were good uh it was going to be a big hit 
I had a 400 liter freezer full of mutton, mince, prawns, chicken, and pomfrets. Horribly expensive pomfrets at 1800 rupees a kilo, two to a kilo. Uh, I paid off my staff and sent them home on Saturday for the entire month. And I said, take 10 days on the house. We've done well. We thought the lockdown was supposedly 10 days. It would be maybe a month after that. We really thought it would be that much time. Uh, we came out of lockdown in August. I threw away 400 liters capacity of meat, fish, chicken, prawns, and pomfret. Those pomfrets hurt the most. Okay, but after that much time in the freezer, there was no way I was going to sell it to my clients. We had rats. We had wiring that had been eaten up. We had equipment that needed to be serviced seriously. We did all of that. On the 9th of August, my manager got COVID and died within six hours. He'd been like a close friend, a family member. It was a horrendous blow. We went into quarantine for the next 15 days. And I realized that there was no way to carry on because half my staff had gone away to Gaon and I had no clients and I had overhead still then every month I was paying rent, so on and salaries and so on and so forth. So on the 1st of September, 2020, I shut down. On the 1st of September, 2021, I restarted my business. I had sold off about 60% of my equipment I had rented a place in Washi to move into because I was getting my house in Kargar done up after, I think, 14 years. And uh, so there was a lot of loft space and extra space. I moved everything in there. And uh, we did home catering. Priya and I cooked in the kitchen. We had one of our staff still on salary. So we sent out small orders and things like that just to let people know that we were still there. The home chefs did brilliantly and it was their time to shine. And I think uh, a lot of them will become caterers in their own rights. Uh, because people felt that if it was coming out of somebody's house in small batches, it was healthier, safer and better food. And a lot of home chefs, so there were a lot of bad home chefs who kind of got lost on the way and there a lot of good home chefs. A couple of them are here like Arzu. Arzu does some amazing stuff in Bangalore. And there are others too that I know. There are home chefs that I order from. Okay, My mom was technically a home chef till she became a caterer. So I keep saying she was ahead of the trend in that. And uh, we started business again. And uh, it was a very heavy heart that we started business again. But October, November and December have not been bad. October, November were actually rather good. December was slow. Uh, January, we really don't know how it's going to be. So far, we've got our fingers crossed, but every single person that I know in the catering business, every single restaurateur that I know has taken a hit. Everybody has cut wages because there is no choice. Everybody has pulled back on staff and this 50% thing, first of all, I don't understand, but that's the law of the land. And if it's the law of the land, you have to follow it. But this 50% thing makes no sense. It's like an aeroplane. When you say every alternate seat, which they don't, but never mind that these days, how does it make a difference? It's a closed ecosystem in that aeroplane. How is, you know, one person per row or three persons per row actually really going to increase the load of the virus? You know, there is probably not even an ounce of coronavirus in the entire planet. Yes, not even an ounce. That's how small it is and that's how dispersed it is. Okay, so... I don't see how that makes a difference, but we have this 50% thing. No restaurant can afford to run at 50%. People are scared to go to restaurants. When they started going again, there was Delta and then there is Omicron. And actually there's a hell of a lot of Delta out there just now along with Omicron that most people don't know about. Yep, that's also true. And uh, no, it's not as bad, I mean, sorry. Not as bad. I know people who've been suffering for 10, 15, 20 days after Omicron has come and gone. So I don't know how it's good by saying it's not as bad. Okay. And uh, everybody that I know, in the, as I said, in the food business has suffered. Yes, there have been surges. Uh, yes, there has been a lot of 
almost every single restaurant has started doing home deliveries in a big way. People that were not doing them before. Okay. I'll tell you the one really good thing as far as I'm concerned about this uh, virus situation. All my payments are now online. Pay first. I deliver by VFast. You pay VFast at your end. I am not responsible. Okay. Mm. Uh, it might sound callous or whatever, but it's the only way I can afford to continue to function in this time. Uh, you pay me before the day of the function. Otherwise, I do not execute your order. And it comes in straight to me online. You can NEFT, you can GPay, your choice. That's about it. Uh, I have new suppliers. I have a couple of old suppliers. And they're all very happy to supply to me at my new kitchen in Washi. Hmm. Pay first has been a huge blessing. I mean, I was just saying the same thing. You know, getting money out of people was so difficult. Now, honey, you don't pay me. Honey, I don't see the money. You don't see my food. It's as simple as that. I'm not chasing around in these times, you know, to get my money. So, yeah, that has been a very, very major plus point. Arzu, put on your camera here. Yeah, Arzu, Raghu, do turn on your cameras. And who is anyone else you want to bring in to join the chat? I don't know who else is here just now, but... Uh, uh, Krishnan is here. You can bring him in. Jai is here. You can bring her in. Uh, there's a lot of people here who are going to curse me for not bringing them in. Janice is here. Kyle Pereira is probably Ishita. Uh, it'll be fun to have her there. Uh, who else is there that I can see? Uh, Krishnan, you said, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm Marita just... is here. Inviting the people who Purusha's name to join in on the conversation. So Vanita Vishwanath is also here. All right. You call her in also. Oh, Kyle Pereira is Ishita and Kyle Pereira. You can call them both in. Hmm. So I'm dying for Omicron to get better uh, and release us because Kyle, I am told, is going to invite me home to eat some absolutely kick-ass East Indian food. So I'm putting it on the record out here in front of everybody. Kyle also uh, repairs, maintains a beautiful old vintage motorcycles. So that's why Kyle is a very important person to know. So uh, yeah, let's put it on to gallery view here. Why speaker view? Yes, I've just done that. Hang on. So uh, Arzu is here. She's moved from Pune. To Bangalore and does these amazing pork pop-ups and chicken pop-ups and things like that. Raghu is here. He's living in a cave in Hyderabad from what I know. And we have to rework Pasi food with him. And poor man's been deprived of good Pasi food in Hyderabad. Yeah. Have I got everyone, Kush? Yep, I think you've got everyone. Why can we not see Kyle and, Pere uh, Kyle and uh, Ishita? I was going to say Kyle and Pereira. Jai has refused the panel. Okay, um, it's just that Ishita's got a dry cough. Hi, guys. And uh, she's listening, though. Ah. Okay. And you're more than welcome for more than Eastern food. It's Kima as well. So that, that's good drink as well. See, he's rubbing it into us. Kima and good drinks he's having. Which, which, <laughs> of, like you are, which of you are in Bombay and who I can pile on to? Uh, Bombay region. <laughs> we, are, we are in Bombay. <laughs> okay. No. Oh, don't listen to Peter. <laughs> I was in bloody Navi Mumbai all this time. I didn't see hide no hair of him. He's like Raghu. He's moved into a cave and he's not coming off. Yeah. I have been venturing out. It was just, again, the last... Oh, yeah. I heard you went, you went to the hall yesterday for the first time. <laughs> hmm. Good to hear that. Raghu, good to hear that. Nahin, guys. Yeah, yeah, I have been getting Definitely. out of the house. You're with oh. the mask on. I've been socializing with the mask on. I just don't no, eat or drink it. outside. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Since the last one week, again, I've been... No, no, yeah. but seeing people without a mask on is so so odd, you know, to, to many people. I mean, I've had people on uh, Zoom who've told me, you know, I feel I'm worried about people without mask on Zoom. And I'm like, you're on Zoom. This, this is not that kind of virus. Yeah, yeah. I mean... You don't I mean, just step out here. I'm just looking at even in this phase when we know that the damn thing is spreading like a rumor. And I went out just to get milk 
which is like two minutes from my house, literally. And I may have passed 12 people, out of which four were not wearing masks. There is a snack bar kind of thing there, which is very popular with young people, which is there's the, you know, sort of uh, falafel kind of stuff. And there's a horde of people all there, half of them unmasked. And but you can't eat with a mask, Peter. No, no. I mean, they're hanging out. Ah, okay. They're just being cool. Yeah, they're just like there, you know, they're just being young people, which I have no objection to. But they're doing being young people without masks, <laughs> which... When you're young, you believe you're immortal. Yeah. But yeah, so folks, all of, uh, those in the audience as well, please do uh, use Q&A. If any of you want to ask your questions on audio, let me know and I will uh, turn on audio for you. And those of you who have joined the panel at uh, Kurush's invitation, uh, the the table no, is- I'm going to shut up for a bit and I want you all guys to talk. Yeah. This is, the model is we're hanging out. We were at a restaurant table. We saw you guys and we said, come join us, right? So please uh, feel free to bring in, broadly keep it somewhat connected to food. But aside from that, <laughs> it's open. I have no questions. I was just thinking, so I have attended Purusha's uh, studying food workshop and diasporic workshop. So, you know, I, I, I keep hearing all these lines. So today he's touched on another really, uh, how do I say, it? topic close to heart on academic part. Other than all this food knowledge I've heard of across the pandemic, I think this he touched a raw nerve on PhD and visiting faculty and academic. So yeah, always a pleasure to hear you. So no questions really. I mean, yeah, but go for it. Go for it. Get that bile out. Yeah, yeah. Get that spew that vitriol. I know. I'm yeah. just telling. I think I think visiting faculty is another uh, way of saving money for all these really famous colleges with huge trusts. Uh, you know, huge money in trusts. And uh, you said 60 rupees an hour. So it's been from 350, 300 per hour. Per hour. And I've had actual colleges and I don't want to like name call them or, you know, no such thing. But uh, they also counted the hours and they said uh, it's a free Zoom call which you're using. So 40 and 40 is 80 minutes. So we can't pay you for 90 minutes, you know. I'm like, oh, what? So they actually have sent that as a very formal line. I was like, mm, okay. So we know it's a 90 minute lecture, but and the Zoom call is mine and the internet is mine. Okay. So it's not like the college reimburses, but well, that's the story for another day. And then I also did an Excel sheet and said, even in that 80 minutes, you paid me 300 rupees less. Then I think they were sheepish enough because I'm like, dude, I'm going to collect it from you and give it to charity. I mean, no way in hell. Another famous college, I have followed up with them since the lockdown. And they said, you have to come to college uh, to pick up your check, um, April 2020. So I said, the chief minister has just told people not to travel and, you know, lockdown and all. Okay. Then they said, the accounts person has ran away with so after deleting accounts, whatever it means. Again, famous college in South Bombay. Uh, Prof. Uh, Kurush Dalal might have uh, mentioned that college name today, but I'm not saying more. We <laughs> wait. I followed up with PPT saying these are the lectures I've taken, blah, blah, blah. I think one year later, they said the, finally the money is ready, but we don't do any FT. It's a check again. Uh, we don't do courier either. So if you want, you're not essential staff. You're not allowed in the train, so to say, but come. Of course, then I sent to VFAST and I'm like, I'm collecting the money from you for sure. You know, so yeah. yeah. So anyway, uh, pointing alert over, <laughs> over to more food related topics. There's a question here from Vikas T who asks, uh, how, what do you believe will be the future of street food in the post pandemic world? Today, street food runs mainly on volumes with thin margins. PPE is not really affordable to many vendors. Uh, and do we see businesses go away and move to more structured food service and fewer street vendors? I, I don't see them go anywhere. They're out in full force. Uh, <laughs> they haven't gone anywhere. They don't have a choice. They come out and they do business and people go there and eat. They're, they're crowded. Some of the most crowded uh, places on the street. Yeah, I mean, it's also like most of these people. Oh, sorry. 
anecdotally from what I can see in my small corner of the world, which is the only place I've been for the last almost three years, uh, the street food guys are still there. They are working. Uh, they've stayed open as long as they're permitted to stay. Uh, and it's the restaurants that were closed at various points in time. But a lot of the street food guys were, as Arzu said, and Raghu said, they have to. What's the choice? They don't have cushions. You know? Also less overheads. Mm. See, me and my two cousins and their sons from Gao are running this business. Mm. And we all live in one room. And we are a happy family whether we like it or not. Mm. You know, and we'll all live on what up if we have to that we cook for uh, selling and whatever's left over we eat. Mm. Uh, so yeah, there are fewer overheads. They're not going anywhere as far as I'm concerned. But uh, some of them have been hurt very badly. Some families have taken solid hits when the main food provider has suddenly died. The money provider of the family has died of COVID. So those those deaths, those guys are shut, whether you like it or not. But there are lots of desperate people out on the street, huh, guys. I don't know if you know this, but I know a, a five-star chef who's uh, got quite famous because he's doing biryani on the streets of North Bombay. He has a hadgari and he brings two digs of biryani from his house because uh, he'd spent all his money because he was earning very well and had a very good trajectory. And he'd done up his house with his parents and told them not to worry. And now he was going to work and do everything and blah, blah. He was in the cruise liners. He'd come home for a holiday and pandemic. And no jobs in the cruise liner said, honey, don't come back. Hmm. As it is, you only get paid when you're out at sea. So finally, after six months, he started making biryani at home. Selling it on the street. And what else, what what option do you have? So the home chefs, the bhaji, so there are so many sabjiwalas out on the road and hiring, you know, you, you go and see uh, Madam Z's beauty parlor, but there's a guy selling sabji inside it in Navi Mumbai. And the reason for this is just this. Madam Z packed up business and went away. You can't afford to change the board or anything. At the most, you got a flex or two pieces of cardboard outside saying, this is my number. And you stuck one of those stickers which says, uh, scan this to GPA. They are selling sabji over there because people have to eat. I don't think they're going anywhere. Mm. If I may, please um, also. There's all, uh, just two things. There's one of them is also they don't know what else to do with it because they've become like they've spent so many years just focusing on like making the perfect samosa that fits the taste of the locality that they are in, something like that. And you don't know what else you can do. And they've got their family here and everything. And secondly, another thing that I've been noticing recently is the meat shops over here. In the evening, you have um, you have someone coming and making kebabs out of the leftovers, offals and meats, uh, meat pieces. And that's something that's very new and you get them for pretty cheap. I think you get around 100, 150 grams of meat for 90 bucks. But this is again, someone who used to work at a different restaurant has now started doing this. They've, they've sort of like tied up with the meat shop and they've been doing this over here. And that's all. Krishnan, what's your take on this? Um, uh, my take on it is that uh, I was looking at uh, what they recently did. So Bangalore International Exhibition Center did a talk by Mr. Patel, who's doing redoing the uh, National Monument, basically. So one of the things that he mentioned that was interesting is they're going to create an avenue for food vendors on the main Rajpath, all the Thelawalas and people like that. They're going to create specialized zones, public toilets uh, for people to use the space and for vendors to be there. And my take is that, <laughs> that the people who it is intended for will never be able to rent it uh, and but what will happen is all the chefs who are coming out of, like all the chefs who came out of the Mughal cuisine darbar came to and opened these small shops all over the place and started selling stuff that they used to make in the, they were experts in making naan and only naan. And they went and created shops to make naan and they came out. Uh, so people in all these like mega star shaped factories are going to come out of uh, those places and do like they're experts in biryani and then they'll start selling biryani but hopefully they will bring the sort of the health culture towards the market right but my favorite pastime of now is to look at all the 
videos that people put up of stupid food currently like all the stupid sandwiches that they make like with 700 things and then compressed and all these americans growing why why would i want to see the salad with the brownie on top of it and and nobody understands that india has so much surface of processed cheese now that you can just build cheese sandwiches or cheese castles at the moment that that's the fun bit don't tell people about the surplus cheese there's a question here from uh, sushmita a old friend of mine uh, oh yeah so we have some odd surpluses in places and we can't get them to the places that want to eat them so yes yeah. uh, uh i think uh, sushmita says uh, do you think the covid years have made us all more venturesome because we've all been experimenting with food and will this lead to new developments what do you have to say ishita i think ishita has a cough kyle said yeah yeah so she's got a dry cough but um, i'm going to ask her for a feed or uh, her um, retort to that and i'll get back to you all right but anyone else want to chip in on that do you think that this will lead to new developments are we being more venturous on food anyone want to step in on that please please somebody arzu you don't get to travel much and like now because everything's become so visual you constantly like connected to the world and you're constantly looking at food that you can't make at home so when you find someone who can who's actually making that attempt and is able to send it to you to your house you're actually like oh you know what maybe i do want to try this maybe i do want to try this and then that's pushing people to try it on their own as well to like sort of figure out like okay what do i do i mean you have weekends now you're not going out and you were not going out at that point like especially during the lockdown so you were just at home and you're like okay what do you do there's only so much of netflix and amazon and everything that you can watch i mean you run out of content after some point um that's my take true, true. vanita i think in the short term yeah i mean to a large extent all this social media and this whole discovering of new ingredients and you know regional food uh, taking uh, precedent and all but i'm not really sure whether people are genuinely that much more experimentative i think it's like a i don't know semi temporary phase maybe i'm not really sure that people really are going to go that gung ho because there is still that uh, familiarity you still seek familiarity so i mean though we've seen uh, uh, you know like uh, uh, there is definitely so i was reading this godrej uh, food report that they get get every year and there there have been certain trends like for example you know in home consumption of uh, drinks for example and mixers have uh, increased and you know they've pointed out to some trends along with of course the banana breads and the dalgona coffees and uh, all of that or uh, sardo for example suddenly there's been a bit of a revolution i'm not really sure it's off correct so the most I, initial this thing has tapered off correct so i i i feel it's uh, like a bit short lived i'm not really sure that we really are that experimentative honestly not like the k drama culture now i know like suddenly a lot of us are ordering korean food you know and when they discovered it and you know there has been a bit of ordering from korean restaurants but is that genuinely a thing i would i have my reservations on that <laughs> okay so can i jump in with something yeah please, sorry please. sorry so uh, on the bread thing this is a funny thing that has happened here in the uk um i'm i'm in birmingham so when uh, kurush said birmingham i hope it's this and not birmingham alabama uh but uh, what's happened is now in the supermarkets you're getting bread cultures where all you do is you poke a hole pour some water let it sit overnight and the next day morning you put it in your uh, sort of oven and you get bread so the industry is already responding here because there was a wow. flour shortage and now they are doing pre baked bread tins those so they're giving you away tins you just poke a hole and put it in the other thing that's happened is, is there's a coconut water revolution happening here so now you're getting full coconuts all with the insides and stuff with just a put a hole in the top and they give you a straw so they give you a bamboo pick to put a hole in the top and they give you a straw so you can drink it and they pre cut the coconut so that you only have to hit it with a hammer and it will become two and you can eat the stuff inside as well so 
it's happening here i see it happening quickly the other thing i have is in india we have stuck uh, i find it difficult that in cities that people are still sticking to cooking when pe- places like singapore hong kong places like high density cities like shanghai have given up cooking they just have a unit for heating up food and the whole sort of like a uh, refryer thing that came out of china the air fryer thing that came out of china is sort of evidence to that is that they only use air fryers because they can't have full ovens and they just use it to heat up stuff and make fries quickly at home but there most of them eat outside and because they eat outside the food on the street is cheap it's clean mostly and a lot of people just buy food and go home so i i'm i'm sort of like thinking that you know places like bangalore when i go back i still see people cooking and i'm like you shouldn't be you should be eating on the street like i had a check friend whose grandmother check grandmother who's lived in prague all her life told him if you live in a city you should not be cooking at home you should go eat food go to the park read a book go spend some time at a pub and then come home and sleep if you're staying at home for more than half a day then you probably need to buy a house outside the city the city is not for you anymore and that sort of like clicks up uh, uh, ring the bell somewhere so you know what you're saying is not wrong but then <laughs> singapore created those hawker centers and they cracked down on cleanliness they made sure that garbage i, I mean i don't know how many of you all have been to bangkok or seen the street food in bangkok on television and have you noticed the sheer lack of cats dogs birds uh, cockroaches and all of that which on most of the city streets in india you'll see uh, so one of the reasons is everybody has a covered dustbin dustbins are emptied with manic consistency throughout the day you know manically you have conservancy workers who keep coming and picking it up you have to keep your place clean there are no two ways about it okay so these are the things that make a difference when the government actually provides infra and tells the people that we'll give you leeway but there are some things that you can't mess with and this makes an enormous amount of difference also work from home definitely i completely agree with this if you're working from home and still living in kaf parade locked up just now uh, a that's a waste of money waste of space waste of time and all of that uh if you can telecommute or e commute or whatever the new words are that are going to come out shouldn't you be in a better place look guys i my wife and i went out for a 37 day trip we spent about 15 of them in bangalore 10 of them at arzu's house okay uh, arzu's kitchen to be technical uh because she wasn't cooking at that time it was a family wedding um we did everything that we were doing lectures this that and the other online wherever and whenever we had to we were running uh, our very popular studying food and politics course a second iteration with some people all over the world coming in to speak on it and we ran it out of arzu's house and it was the last couple of lectures out of one of my colleagues house with whom i was working on the same thing so we managed to do 37 days 3175 kilometers and most people didn't realize that we were not in kargar and i live in kargar i'm happy over here i have a kitchen in washi which is central enough for the whole of bombay and every single advertisement of mine says that our kitchen is in washi so tomorrow if you suddenly wake up and say why oh, am i paying so much we fast because it's coming from washi if you haven't figured that out then what did my kitchen is in washi mean to you i have i have one client like this every weekend i'm doing weekend menus i'm happy to do them what i've also realized is people like less choice now you know there was a time when you wanted more choice and you wanted 400 things on your menu i now do weekend menus with less than 10 things way less than 10 i mean 10 is like you know really pushing the envelope seven things i think was our last weekend menu and uh, it's normally one chicken variant of the same one mutton variant of the same one veg variant of the same and a main course a starter a dessert that's it okay and uh, good response so i can't complain so a lot of things are changing and people want good clean wholesome food a uh, lot of people want to call for food from outside because they're sick of cooking at home 
This lockdown has not been a very happy space for people cooking. You know, everybody has been forced to cook. It's not necessarily a lovely thing to happen. Mm -hmm. When you got to work and cook and work and cook and work and cook and work from home very often is harder than going out to work. I know people who are begging their companies to take them back to work because they live in one room or a one room kitchen or a one bedroom hall kitchen with five other people and work from home is not happening. I don't know if Varita's faced this, but uh, two of my uh, friends uh, were overseeing an exam, invigilating one online, and you have to keep your camera on for exam. And they realized this girl was sitting in a toilet and doing her exam on a mobile phone. Okay, so they were like really worried about the kid. So after that, they said, you know, maybe we'll do an intervention and call her up, and they did. And said, look, kid, is everything okay? You were locked up inside a loo for two hours, you know, doing your exams. And she said, ma'am, I live in a one-room house with an attached toilet bathroom. There are six of us in the house. I had to beg everybody to make sure that nobody used the toilet for two hours so that I could do my exams. It's the only quiet place that I have. We don't realize how many of us are privileged to work from home. And then we are still paying through our noses to pay rent in upscale, upmarket Tony neighborhoods. Mm. I don't see the logic. I mean, specifically, this whole thing about... Uh online studies, I know a lot of people who are teachers and a number of people who work in the Teach for India ecosystem and the whole lot there, because Teach for India works with schools in the lower uh, economic, uh, you know, spectrum. And the same thing there, the number of kids who are getting left out of the education system, you know, because me, I think about it and I say, hey, what's wrong with online? But you don't realize the kind of difficulty it is for the kind of kids that Kurosh was talking about, uh, who have even less. Who, I mean, there's that one device in the house, a phone usually, which the father will be most likely to be using, right? And takes away, and maybe there is another one at home. Uh, a girl child is very unlikely to be getting that phone, for instance, for anything, and drops out. That entire set of stuff that scenario there as well. So many children all over the country being left out of the education system. But, uh, and the other thing that Kurush was talking about, which is cook and work, cook and work. In the recipe group that I run on Facebook, one of the things that I learned is that I thought in this time of lockdown that it would be finally seeing a lot more men cooking or learning to cook bollocks. Okay, the woman who was also working was still expected to do three meals, three meals of fresh food every day. Like refrigeration, refrigeration has not been invented in large parts of India. Refrigeration is only for keeping your cold water or maybe your ice cream. But God forbid you should eat the same thing for lunch and dinner. You know, fresh food, three meals a day, people with dietary preferences or dietary restrictions, right? Some you have to make different things. Uh, Father-in-law who will, if does if he does not get rice for lunch and chapati for dinner, is going to make a very very sour face about the entire thing. All of that. So lockdown, getting more people to cook. Same people carrying more burden as far as I could see, barring a lot of people like me, who had no choice because I live alone. I had no one I could lean on, and I had to learn how to cook, <laughs> right? And uh, a very few people that I could see who had never cooked before and were starting to cook now, mostly in the same kind of boat as, as I was, necessity. Very few people were cooking for their families when they hadn't cooked before. There's always the men who enjoyed cooking. They are basically pedestalized because men cook, ooh, superhuman. <laughs> You know, sorry, I just went off on a rant. <laughs> no, but I understand what you're saying. I, I was just, I was just highlighting that, like, the gender disparities actually became a lot more obvious during this time, in terms of like, in terms of everything, especially during food, because you, because not only do you have to make three meals there, also everyone in the house has different meal timings. Because someone will have a meeting, someone will have a class, you have to adjust to all of that. And, and somehow, as, as, this, as our society is all the role 
all of all the management tends to fall on women and on top of that they have to do all the work because if they don't do the work that means that's a lesser income coming into the house and at this point you don't know how it how bad it can get oh and gender disparity also in terms of the amount the stats show that uh, you know cases of domestic violence have risen so much unfortunately in the lockdown you know and uh, there is this organization uh, i've met that lady she does red dot uh, foundation or something and she said that they in fact did something where you know uh, you could just put in a photo of you with a bindi and like even send the photo because the your your cooked in the same house you can't even just go to your neighbors or your mothers or your sisters for asking help and uh, uh, she was actually telling that you know in her society i mean very sad but she heard some noise of somebody probably you know beating up the the chairman just went and knocked the uh, bell and you know to stop so yeah i mean lockdown has not been easy for i don't know mental health is again another area which i think we're all going to be having a lot of trauma after this thing whenever if ever this thing gets over not just okay. mental health but one thing that i one of my little things that i've been thinking about which is this is you know your mental health professional has two things that your friend doesn't which is an education that is focused on mental health and you've learned about it and objectivity right which your friends can't give you and this has been a situation where whatever is causing that trauma which is the world that we live in now is everybody was in that same boat your mental health professional was also locked down was also being deprived of human company was of society, socialization and so on but you know just staying with the the entire lockdown and food thing one of the things for me was in the recipe group again was the amount of recipes that were coming in which were food being repurposed the thing that you made for lunch and you make it some other way for dinner and i was like why are you doing this it is so you're just putting more oil and frying it ye wo all of that because i am looking at it from my point of privilege plus the fact that i am like bhai i will cook once and i will put it in the refrigerator and i will eat the same thing for 3 days because you know i can't be asked to cook for every little meal and in someone they said listen baba you have to understand that if i don't have a fresh meal up there something that looks different from what i did in the previous meal no one's going to eat it that's why this entire very ingenious set of things which are repurposing things that were cooked before in a different way but there's very often little choice because people won't eat the same thing so exactly uh, okay exactly. one of the things that riya and i discovered during uh, lockdown uh, rather i convinced riya to buy finally was uh, the electric cooker the crock pot mm. okay and uh, she was kind of against it one more device one more piece of junk and we thought we realized it's one of the best things we bought one pot everything that you want to do in a pressure cooker you can do in it it grills braises roasts bakes blah 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 and you can have the fan on while you're doing it in bombay that's a huge huge thing yeah. and you get put it to cook and it'll cook and keep warm cook when you want it to cook slow cook fast all of those things and we very often make one pot of khichdi eat it for lunch eat it for dinner reheat it in the night put away the leftovers in the fridge bung the internal thing back back inside put half a cup of water and heat it up for lunch the next day because we were sick of cooking and there was just two of us now imagine if pappu ke papa doesn't like idli but pappu wants idli for breakfast and then uh, uh, pappu's dadi can't eat idli because she's got diabetes and uh, the woman in the house is just slaving and slaving and slaving her ass off mm -hmm. so it really hasn't helped and she's got to go to work look years ago i had a friend of a colleague of mine i mean she's still technically a colleague of mine and she lived in borevli she worked in uh, chani road so she commuted every day by the train she cooked breakfast in the morning for the whole family gave them all breakfast she cooked lunch and packed it for everybody including herself left lunch behind for her in-laws and then went to work she came back home dog tired and then cooked food again and her mother in law cribbed throughout her life about the fact that there was a bai who made rotis and her bahu wouldn't make hot rotis at home so every bloody weekend she made hot rotis for her mother in law and this is all pre pandemic so yeah women's women's lots are terrible yeah as i was saying rules that 
as Arzu points out in the chat, free time that women got with a few hours alone at home, even that you lost, right? Kyle, were you able to uh, get what, whether Ishita had anything to say about that? Do chip in if you feel like it. Yeah, so what she was saying was, before she's, she's passed out now, uh, what she was saying was that um, I think being cooped up at home with limited amount of uh, groceries and, and uh, raw uh, ingredients has kind of forced us to experiment. I mean, um, you make do with what you had, otherwise you, you, you go home or other you sleep um, hungry. So I think that's, that's, that's pushed this whole, um, you know, uh, movement towards experimenting with food and, you know, a lot of people who couldn't previously cook have gotten onto the internet and figured out how to make a dal khichdi or, you know, uh, biryani or whatever, some, you know, something of that sort. So I think it's, 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 it's imperative that um, we all learn to, to share, uh, you know, the chores of the house and, and uh, all of that. But it also goes to show um, how much uh, labor and, and time and effort goes into feeding a family, right? I mean, that's something that a lot of us men have taken for granted for generations. So, <clears throat> yeah. I think the that movie, The Great Indian Kitchen, was such an, for so many people, an eye opener. And for so many women, was like, dude, that's, you know, that's what's been happening in your house, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> See, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry, but I also think this is a, a very apologetic, that movie. In the sense that we all knew this was going on. Did we really need somebody to make a movie to tell us this truth? Sadly, we did. Mm -hmm. And even the, and, and I'm sorry, but I realized the movie had its limitations, but I thought he was pulling his punches at some point. I mm. mean, I'm sorry, I get very, very rabid about these things, but come on, you, you girls out here, come on, speak up for your fairer sex, tougher sex. First beat, up. Sex. First beat up Kurush for saying fairer sex and all that, and then we'll carry on. Huh, no, no, I know. I mean, Kurush, uh, I know Kurush can still stay and get away with that because he does believe in sharing chores. And, you know, throughout the uh, uh, lockdown, you know, there is all these bakers and adventures and appam and all that. So I still know that he believes in cooking as a life skill and not uh, looks at cooking as a gender thing. But yeah, so the thing is, I think why that movie did so, uh, whatever, did uh, get a lot of popularity is also because. Um, uh, this, the, you know, I don't know. I mean, I am a South Indian, so I can tell this. Like in Kerala, for example, it's also a, there is a lot of patriarchy, which is even more than other states in that sense. And I'm using it like thoda about, you know, like I don't know, taking a creative leap. So maybe that film really did that way well that way. I mean, it it had its limitations and all. But my bigger question is, I don't think any. Did we really change after we watched the movie or, you know, is there really been a behavioral change? I'm not sure, but I think it at least started some conversations. So to that extent, I'm like, yeah, if conversations, I mean, don't start. I mean, these behavioral changes will take like ages to do, right? Like even advertising and movies, at least it was a start. That's what I thought for the great Indian kitchen in that sense. Starting. I mean, Awareness is a big deal, right? At least yeah. if knowledge, acknowledgement, conversation. It's not changing things. It may not change things, but at least it's there. There's someone uh, testifying to that reality, right? And like I said, this entire thing, what Kurush was saying, what I was saying was the same thing that if you... Uh, it's not that this wasn't happening before. It's not that no one knew. It was happening in the houses of people who were saying, wow, does that happen? Kurush would also like to say that Rhea cooks more than Kurush in the house. Huh? For the record. Uh, Kurush can cook. Kurush is a lazy bum and has got nothing to do with gender. He's just lazy. And uh, Kurush makes coffee and breakfast. Rhea usually puts lunch or dinner together. And we kind of sandwich one meal on most days, if we can. Mm -hmm. uh, she cooks more than I do, way more than I do. Uh, if there's no work at work, I drag one of the staff down to cook. That's one of the one of the really big plus points of having a catering business. 
and uh, and having staff on the phone to say aaj kaam pe mat jana ghar pe aana khar ghar so hmm. completely shameless about this i'm paying the guy a wage in any case okay um that said um look yes there are gender roles a lot of women are not going to like what i'm saying but there are gender roles uh if you're bringing up a baby at home and you are at home and you do the cooking and taking care of the house it's not a crime okay uh yes it's unpaid work and all of that if you want to look at it that way but if there's one breadwinner in the house uh that's pretty fair also but if there's one breadwinner in the house that is you and you're cooking and bringing up the babies and massaging the mother in law's feet okay and getting tossed around every time the husband gets drunk then that's not happening and that happens a lot then i was telling peter about parvati kadam who was my mother's left hand right hand and left foot and my mother's dowry as we called her was more family than family and uh, she used to regularly get tossed around by her much older husband when she was younger and then in her old age when her husband was much older than her and after she put down a couple of quarters of dr brandy after a 1400 person catering thing she'd go home and beat the shit out of her husband and when her husband came home to complain my mother chortled with glee and said you had that coming i'm so glad this is happening to you which yeah nobody should get beaten up and violence is very bad and all of that but yeah that's the way it is so life sucks and sometimes paybacks a bitch okay and you better learn to live with it so um, yeah that's the way things are um i don't even know why women want to be equal with men i just don't understand that bit peter this equality bit i always thought women are far tougher you know i think try it's... squeezing a baby out of a sphincter a male sphincter forget about anything else okay mm-hmm. and uh, yeah you know i know a lot of men who cry when they have constipation so you know if women can have babies woohoo they're like so way tougher than men it's not fun and the thing so is way about, the thing is about equity and opportunity and that being the thing of having the the right to aspire towards the same kind of things i mean i don't think anyone's arguing about the that the fact that technically people with who are born uh, with a certain set of chromosomes can are the only ones who can bear children right aside from that bit we talking the conversation is about equity right about yes, yes. the choice and the yes. ability to make those choices and those choices are not available to a huge number of women you know i mean here we know we know kurush we know that where kurush is coming from and uh kurush may make his jokes and what not but and but we know that he pulls his weight when it comes to you know what's happening in the thing but there's a whole lot of people who are completely oblivious to this but uh if jay you wanted to add something i've enabled you to turn on your microphone please come on whenever you want to yes hi uh so i just wanted to add something in terms of things that are changing uh, positively uh, i know quite a few people uh, who work who worked in uh, commercial kitchens and there were like extremely toxic and sexist places um over the lockdown they realized that it was not a good place for their mental health and in general uh, career advancement so uh, a lot of them have actually started their own businesses and it was of the way the lockdown so worked i think toronto has probably the longest lockdown in the entire world uh, but how it has worked sure it has really benefited them a lot of new uh, similar to we fast there have some companies that have cropped up which are helping small businesses so i think that's something that has been a positive outcome of the lockdown in terms of the women now standing up for themselves in commercial kitchens i'm hoping that this sparks a change and we have more conversations that keep going on mm-hmm. absolutely and i should completely agree with that i should be just pointing out in the chat and you know this is a thing that i notice a lot during the lockdown what happens when there are two breadwinners i mean technically there's another argument to be had on breadwinners all right because the labor that is being done in the home is an economic contribution to the home which is not paid for in a salary but 
nevertheless is of economic value. But even in this case, where two people are working outside the home, it is still the burden on the woman to uh, do the cooking. The percentage That's what I was saying. No, but a friend of mine who went to work, husband went to work, he didn't cook worth a damn. He was a really nice guy. He never beat her up. I mean, what? Really, he never beat her up as a criteria. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I no, but look, I work in rural India. I regularly have women tell me, nice I am some malak bare. And the word for husband is malak in Marathi. Okay. And that's exactly what it means. No, it's not some euphemism. And she says, No, he doesn't beat me up too often. I'm like, what do you mean by he doesn't beat me up too often? No, no, he very seldom beats me up. I mean, I don't care. I mean, my, I couldn't even think of raising a hand on my wife. Not to mention she tanned the shit out of me. But even then, I mean, that's one of the things that was nailed into me by my parents. And parents, not father. You know, you didn't do that. I mean, okay, so maybe I'm an MCP because I wouldn't raise a hand on a woman unless she was really lamming it into me. But uh, yeah, that's the way I was built. I also opened doors very often for people, yeah, especially women, women with children, older women. I'm an MCP in that. Fair enough. But, uh, and I don't mind eating the same thing for the next meal also at all. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, I get a lot of this shit regularly from people that I work with about what they're willing to accept. And see, when a woman is beholden to a man, for everything, when she has no salary, okay? And she's been married off early. All she's been taught is how to cook, which has been, of course, torn down and reworked by her mother-in-law usually, okay? And uh, this lady then has no choice but to suck it up because if her husband throws her out on the road with her children, what is she going to do? Her parents won't take her back because of the stigma attached to it. Mm -hmm. There is no place for her to go. What choice does she have? I know women who live in multi crore houses in Bombay, whose husbands have affairs that their wives know about, hate the fact, but suck it up because they're driving a Mercedes and have three servants and an amazing house. And when I spoke to that lady and I said, you know, this is wrong. And she says, no, not really. You know, I have a damn good life thanks to this. And I was like, I can't comprehend it, but then this is your choice. I mean, it is choice. This is also choice. You don't have to like it. But this is also choice at the end of the day. Maybe it's a choice because there is no other choice. Or maybe she feels that if she strikes out on her own, she'll make peanuts and not be able to afford a scooter. But that's her choice. So I don't know. See, I'm privileged. I'm a man. Just by being born man, I'm privileged. So I can't even really comprehend her situation. I'm sorry. The whole thing of being born male, being born uh, urban, being access to education, all of these things are privilege. Yeah. And in the, some of the comments there, Sushmita's, uh, Arzu is like, he doesn't mind eating the same thing for the next meal. What a hero type, you know? Oh, what a hero. He allows her, this allows her to work. I allow my daughters to work. I allow my wife to work. Wow. What are you talking about? But yeah, then the entire baby thing. And at a complete tangent here, the whole thing of in disability, you, you have the same kind of stuff happening, which is the whole Divyang label for a lot of people is pedestalization, pretty much like it is for you know, women, baby, whatever. The, the baby still has to go home and make hot chapatis. The disabled person, Divyang, you know, divine body parts, whatever it is, but uh, stay at home. We're not going to do anything about making a ramp or making our roads disability friendly or any such thing. This, this shortcut to deification as absolving yourself of further, further responsibility for equity is a terrible thing. And being used blatantly to, you know, by this, Vanita says, he allows me to visit my mother. Yeah. The, the thing of enabling good living, the opportunity for a better life, whatever your choices are, you may make choices, but for so, so many people, there are no choices. Yeah. 
And you know, Peter, it's not just that there are no choices. You can always say there is choice. Hmm. But how much of that choice is really a tangible choice? You know, just a choice on paper is not choice. So, oh, you can always get up and walk. That is not really choice. You know, it, it might sound like choice. I'll tell you something. As somebody who's disabled and who's had his fair share of, and I'm, I'm not even like some, some 35% disabled or something like that. I don't even figure out how they make these percentages of disability. Uh, this complete callousness of uh, the disabled uh, space on a local train in Bombay used to be just enough for seven people to sit in one row facing a wall with people standing over there. And that was the disabled compartment. Can't get a wheelchair into it. No. So then they created a wheelchair compartment and I was very proud to see because this gentleman the cycle used to regularly catch the disabled compartment back with me. But come rush hour and it's free for all. Disabled, not disabled, everybody is in that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the fat Parsi is mad. He throws people out who are not disabled. He calls the cops at the next station. Okay, so I had a fair reputation one time when I used to go to the unit. You know, people would step out and wouldn't come in because I'll call the cops at the next station. And I had cop friends in the railway, railway police because of this. But what I'm trying to say is that in India, it doesn't matter. You know, there are just so many of us, our population, and nobody wants to bell the cat. Nobody wants to talk about the white elephant in the room. There are too many of us in this country. Way too many of us. There need to be fewer of us. And the bloody BJP loving buggers who go to America should all be lined up and shot with the minimum number of bullets required. But that's an aside and that's my personal bugbear. But just think of it. Yeah? Mm. I get the most bizarre people attacking me. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy when I'm attacked by the right wing. But when I'm attacked by gender neutral people and told you cannot understand my pain because you are a cishet person, I had to try and figure out what the cishet was. And that meant that I was born male, comfortable with being male, and I was heterosexual. So that was a crime. Because if you're not cishet, then your disabilities are worse than if you're cishet. I was like, how is my pain different from your pain? My pain is mine, your pain is yours. I agree with that. But how does it work? I finally gave up on the argument and said, fine. Because that's the way it is. There are so many people I know who are mentally disabled, and I mean it, and not in a, not in a bad way, who genuinely have a lot of issues, whose issues are not addressed in this country. Mm -hmm. And then you have the entire woke generation where everybody has a problem and you will see only people who are privileged to have these problems. Yeah, I think I'm what, just old. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot here to unpack and perhaps way beyond the scope of this, but the, the thing of privilege being different in different places for different things, right? And privilege by its very uh, definition is something that you are not aware of. You're not aware of like bias, right? You don't know you're biased. If you knew you're biased and you're still not doing something about it, that's a different question altogether. But bias, privilege, all of these fall in there. And there's a question also of, as Shushmita points out, having a voice and not being heard. Like if you don't have a voice and you do have a voice and people listening to you is one part of it. And the uh, being non-mainstream with where the default person is not you, never you. There's no one to identify with. There is no one uh, who you look up to. All of these things come in. And anger gets in the way here. If you're consistently silenced, if you're consistently not heard, you start screaming. Right? You start being very angry because you're consistently out of the mainstream. You're consistently being pushed out of the way. And I hear you. I mean, Kurosh, you and I are about the same age. So it's not a question of, you know, the thing there of opening yourself out to the learning and 
is also privilege. You know. I think social media has also made us all very, very reactive, I think. Because everybody attacks everybody for everything. Like I posted a picture of having a plum cake on Christmas and somebody questioned that, are you Hindu because you are uh, having... I'm like, dude, I'll go somewhere to eat for food. I swear, like Amir Khan says, in that Dil Chata, I said, I am... I really don't associate food and I mean, whatever, it's fair complex. And I was very shocked when the first time somebody said like, Tum Hindu ho ke, Christian ke, uh, matlab, yeah. kaise celebrate karte ho. And I'm like, like, okay, fine, <laughs> whatever, dude, I want to have my, uh... so we've just become angry as individuals, I feel. Do you know how underprivileged I would be as a Parsi if I could only celebrate Parsi festivals? <laughs> Yeah. Damn. <laughs> I mean, I'm that many Parsi festivals. <laughs> no holy, no Tiwali, no Christmas, no Eid, no yeah. Biryani. Correct. I mean, That's what I say. Will, yeah, yeah, correct. Coming from one of the small minorities as well. I mean, if I didn't get to eat people's Eid ka khana and dhansak and everything, I would be, I mean, according to what I was brought up in my parents, with the practices that my parents followed, I would get Christmas and I would get an Easter egg. If you were lucky. Yeah. But if you were like hardcore Christian, you wouldn't even get that Easter egg. <laughs> yeah. I mean, last year, there was this uh, young person who I got to know on Twitter who posted a picture of rose cookies, which is what it's known in the Christian community as. Like, it's a mold that you deep fry stuff. That led to a firefight. On because, rose cookies? Yeah, because... You are calling it rose cookies. You are appropriating. There was the Malu name for it. And uh, some other thing. And, Achapam. Yes. Achapam. And I'm like, this is a girl who's proudly showing off the rose cookies she made, which are all lying on newspaper so that the oil gets absorbed. It's a simple thing. Why does that become a fight? Her Twitter name still has a rose cookie in it as a sort of a memory of that. But... <laughs> That's the kind of I, I don't get it. I don't get it. But yeah. I, I know what you mean. I, I get this regularly with food. Yeah. I'm also regularly told to go back to Persia. Which... There, there, there are people who are aware that Parsis come from Persia. Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a that new Persia one. Doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I thought there was only go to Pakistan. This is no, 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 hugely no, no. innovative. Innovative. Not to mention to Esan <laughs> Faramo show. India has given you everything. How dare you criticize Hinduism? How dare you criticize Hindutva? How dare oh. you criticize the legally you know, elected oh. representatives of the people? How dare you? Go back to uh -huh. Okay. I've also, yeah, that's been, a rarity I've also been shot usually... out of a canon huh? in a publication with over a lakh sub, uh, subscription. So I, Bruce I, has I, I, actually I, been accused of being a Chechen spy, by the way. Yes. This is a new thing that uh, is cropped up. Yeah, I mean, there was a point which I, I could look at my mixed ancestry and say that I inherit so many different cultures. But uh, now the thing is that I'm going to have to sort of do some surgeries and chop myself into various pieces and send them back to the various countries that some ancestors came from. Aside from the fact that, you know, as Kurush is, uh, you know, area of study shows that we're all migrants, really. Yeah. And, we all came from Africa. We all came from Africa. This is an interesting thing. You know, we are talking about academia earlier, Purush, and the whole thing of the relabeling of the ANI and the ASI, because that made it more palatable for some sets of people, you know, the ancestral North Indians and the ancestral South Indians. So this whole thing about Aryan versus Dravidian, First of all, the linguistic terms. They've got nothing to do with race, religion, caste, or anything. Uh, if you really want to shove your oar in it, um, and if you do DNA studies, almost all South Indian Brahmins are from North India. Okay, in the more recent past than the rest of the South Indians. Uh, they, they came there with Sanskrit and realized they couldn't write it in Tamil. So they had to invent an entire script to be able to write it. I don't know why they just didn't use Devanagari. But they invented Grantha so that they could write it in a more palatable manner for people who spoke Tamil. Okay, and I can only say Tamil. I can't say the Tamiz thing because I wasn't born that way. I'm sorry. Tamil. 
uh, sorry, I can't do it. It's Tamil to me. I learned it as Tamil. I will say it as Tamil. And then I have people who now tell me that the Brahmi script is South Indian. I'm like, okay. So therefore, it should be called the Tamil script. I'm like, uh, how does that work? Then I have an entire bunch of idiots who think of themselves as the flag bearers of the Buddhist past of India and who say that this is wrong. Brahmi is an imposition by the North Indian upper caste. We should call it Dhammalipi because that's what Ashoka calls his writings. He calls his writings, not his script. But yeah, so I have all kinds of people who get their knickers and are not for the most bizarre things on a regular basis. I have now become this very, oh, let that water pass over me, let that flow, let it flow type of thing. No, you want to be an idiot, you want to be an idiot. I mean, I can't stop you. It's in the constitution. You can anally violate yourself if you want. It's constitutionally guaranteed. I, I don't think this entire thing, it's very fashionable to, and easy and and, and understandable to say that social media hell violent in you know verbal violence all the time whatever it is but I do also find that it is very much like a lot of there are things that make it different but the other kinds of social interaction that we have which is it's a function of what you put in I have I'm low profile I'm not one famous ID right but I do know some famous people here and there who will occasionally retweet my stuff and it will go out into a larger audience and that kind of thing. But 95% of my Twitter interaction, uh, I'm not very good on Instagram and Facebook is a walled garden in some ways. So Twitter it is. And on Twitter, anytime that I've said I need help or pointed to someone who needs help, it comes, okay? I will go out there with my silly jokes and puns and have fun and I get very little hit. Yes, caveats, male. If you're a woman, even if you're doing the same kind of thing there, you're going to get people hitting you on, hitting you on your DMs and whatnot if your DMs are open. But uh, it's, it is possible to have a reasonably pleasant social media life, I think, that doesn't have to be attritional. What do you guys think? Can I, can I add something to that? Please. I, I find that, um, you know, a lot of these uh, science, uh, history, art sort of discourses were targeted at specific audiences that used to read it in specific journals, in specific contexts, and they would understand what was like the, the whole issue between, I'm an engineer, I have no understanding of anything in history, right? But what's happening today is there is a lot of stuff that's just like an open drain pipe that's being poured into the social media space. And people who have no understanding of the subject have opinions about the subject. One of the major reasons I have sort of like been taking myself off social media is the fact that I got into, this was four or five years ago, I got into a tiffle with a guy who was talking about the Vijayanagara Empire and by his profile, I knew he sold TVs in a square district in some city in India. And I am not even in India. And we were having a, a fight about a Vijayanagara Empire where both of us have neither studied it. And because we studied one book and I could literally see that I had read two paragraphs. He had read the next two paragraphs and interpreted it completely differently and written something about it and become experts, right? And that's when I started turning off the dials because I was like, this is stupidity. Like, I have no idea about this. And at this rate, yes, people will give me social likes or people will say, you know, go after you, but you don't know what you're talking about. Like, this takes years and years. Like if somebody comes and says something about trains and says it to me, I've been in the profession of learning about them for about 10 years. And I can tell usually what is milk and what is water in that sort of opinion or where this opinion has come from. But if somebody outside that comes and says stuff, then you're like, why are you trying to become an expert in something that you have no interest in? Because if you had interest in it, you would have studied it. Uh, you have no, nothing. You want to be just sitting in an armchair and to tell your personal society that you're well learned. 
but beyond that there is no such thing so social media has become this sort of like a a tube or a channel where everybody can put opinions and everybody can react but nobody in general is talking to the experts like people will talk about climate change but very few people will read the stuff on climate change written by genuine people who are talking about it and that and i have a feeling it's now coming through into academic circles as well especially in the uk it's coming into our sort of like academic schools where we are now being asked very weird questions and i don't know if you listen to amit verma's uh, recent podcast and he mentioned or uh, his guest anupama uh, garima mentioned that academia itself is changing that you can no longer be a scholar in academia anymore you have to be an academic and that is this entire social media feedback loop coming into the academia itself so it's my sort of two cents about it. maybe i'm just too old to agree with that but i'll tell you something about this krishna and as an academic i'll say this see there are three four ways to approach this the first is that we don't teach engineering in school but we teach history so everybody has an opinion about history because it's been shoved down your throat and you wondered why because nobody has ever told you why you study history it's like mathematics why do i need to know the cos and the sin and the tan i mean just will somebody tell me why i need to do this nobody tells you why you need to do this you are told shut up and do it okay if you don't do this well how will you go to medical school how will you go to engineering college how will you go and become an architect when that you will be able to apply it or not is not the point so the education system sadly has failed us on multiple levels that's the first part of it secondly and this is a personal bugbear uh, we can't do without eating we never talk about food sincerely when we are teaching school children okay we just don't teach food because we consider that mothers and fathers have taught them everything that they need to know or mothers and grandmothers or i don't know who if that is not enough we then go to specializations and we have a pecking order krishna so see doctors are on top of the pecking order engineers within that it before mechanical and stuff like that are the next on the pecking order somewhere alongside them are mbas and then there is that amazing thing which is a engineer and an mba together okay who's really neither an expert neither in engineering nor an mba most nor in business management most of the time but that's a different issue then you have the architects who now go around with ar in front of the name all over south india and engineers who go around with er in front of the name because medical professionals have dr in front of the name if they shouldn't they should have an mbbs or an mdb in their name but never mind that i can't take great umbrage as somebody who worked damn hard on his phd and realized that uh, perhaps it should have been given half to my wife but uh, that's just for putting up with me more than anything else uh, also she is invaluable in my finishing my phd uh she also sensibly decided to quit hers i kind of feel bad about that but i realized it sensible not worth the agony coming back to our problem so because you've done 10 years of history you now feel that you're qualified to talk on history then there is the academy of whatsapp and uh, the university of facebook where authoritatively you are told the truth and when you get it from four forums in the morning along with good morning roses and puppy dogs it's got to be the truth okay so what happens is people that you respect are forwarding things to you they got the nice people you respect them you love them why would they be telling you the untruth they would definitely be telling you something that was true so that there is an added bloody problem to that then the fact that nobody thinks that historians are really worth shit i mean history padh ke kya karega ba mein ma karega fir school mein padhega ya college mein padhega aur kya karega you know the serious business of writing history is not done by historians that is done by politicians in our country so all of these problems are there as an archaeologist who takes a back seat even to the poor historians and by the way there are linguists who take a back seat even to archaeologists so we at least feel good about that and we feel bad for them and feel good about ourselves but uh, that's what the problem is so i put 
30 years of my life into studying something and i'm telling you this because i am an authority in this and i'm even telling you that in archaeology i cannot be an authority on all archaeology i can be a jack of all archaeology but i am an authority in a b c d within archaeology similarly an engineer cannot do every single kind of engineering okay most engineers couldn't really put up a shelf straight on a wall without having a committee and a sub committee okay so you know what i'm talking about krishna so let's be very honest about these things indians are argumentative nirad babu said that years and years ago before any internet the argumentative indian we love arguing for the sake of arguing people like me love listening to their own voices that's why we teach <laughs> right so i regularly have problems when i write something from a position of authority and then i'm called out i wrote for the midday because they asked for an op-ed piece and they decided to put a splashy headline on it the op-ed piece was about the statue that they were building in the middle of bombay queen's necklace okay so i made a major plea to the chief minister on facebook so they midday asked me to write an article about it i wrote an article my mistake i was in a hurry so i sent it off uh and flew down to a wedding in jaipur you know destination weddings happen very rarely in archaeologists lives so i went there and the midday decided to put a splashy headline the headline was why build a statue to a king who had nothing to do with mumbai so i got trolled not for my article but i got trolled for the headline so i was like guys why why don't you read the article first then come back to me and if you think i deserve your comment then tell me i don't need to read your article i'm like boss then there's no point on it so this is what we do we are like this and then we follow our leaders because we believe in them so when the great leader says that i was threatened on the highway i mean i was not multi crore rupee car or whatever with bulletproof glass and 25 guys with sub machine guns around me but i was threatened then you believe him no because he is yeah. the capo di tutti capo we elected him we got to live with it so this is what happens so the truth will not set you free the truth will only get you into more trouble i remember kejriwal talking about how we should all have governments like the great state of vaishali which ruled by oligarchy back in the mahajanapada period and i'm thinking vaishali really you obviously haven't read your history have you because when ajatashatru of magadha came to attack vaishali vaishali's people uh, well ruling elite gathered in a conference hall shut the doors to decide what they should do finally the doors were burst open from outside and they said we told you not to disturb us we are taking important decision the decision been taken out of your hands we already been conquered so that's what <laughs> government by you know group does to people yeah this is why india was very good with one man on the top who said off with his head and at least got some of the job done yeah i i have increasingly found that india is full of people who are very liberal in terms of like they do not like any interference from any force outside of their boundary wall in anything in their life ki hum nahi karega kyun karega no but it's it's rather important because one of my cousin and my parents live in vasai and i asked one of my cousins do you know what vasai is important for and of course they've gone through 10 years of studying this pe and so on and they had no clue they have not even visited the fort in vasai and it was like yeah but india's three major treaties were signed in vasai or two major treaties were signed in vasai like the portuguese treaty and then the treaty of vasai with with the marathas which basically handed over control of india to the british what happened in vasai and they are not taught this like they have lived there continuously for like god knows how long but they have no clue and and that is a tragedy also i feel that a lot of like the history that we are taught in school is sort of an here is the way how you study history abhi tum jao padho and then people just sort of like and this is a rant of course that you know you just sort of like you know get through this door this is how you study mathematics you know abhi padho like or you can be a clerk but the clerk jobs are gone and and it's not that, even that, that simple skill. it gets much much worse than that you know much worse than that. first of all local history does not exist 
there is one India and whoever's on top sitting in North India more or less dictates history. Then if you're in Tamil Nadu, all history is Tamil. Uh, way before all the other social media platforms was something called Orkut. I was part of a group of guys who managed a community called Indian History. We had about 2 lakh members or something at the end. Uh, so we had people across time zones keeping an eye and moderating things. We had some hilarious ones. There was this amazing guy, I'll never forget him. He was doing a PhD in America, which is why now I will look at every single American PhD with the same myopia that I look at Indian PhDs. Who said, you see, the truth has been hidden from us for all these years. He was a man of Tamil origin from the Maldives, but his family had forgotten the truths, which only his wife's family had kept alive. You see, the truth was that originally the whole world was colonized by the Tamils who were civilized by these people who came from outer space called the Lemurians. And yeah, Lemuria you have a country. continent in between Africa and India called Lemuria. And they went to this place called Sumer and the people named themselves Sumerians after the Lemurians. And these Sumerians then came to South India who were the Tamilians. So the Tamilians actually all come from Mesopotamia, by the way. And how they then went on to populate the planet. And how this great truth had finally been revealed to him by his father-in-law when his wife found out that he didn't know these truths. So he was now doing his PhD on this. And to make a point, he said that Vercingetorix the Gaul, who was defeated by Caesar at the Battle of Alicia, was actually Vera Singham the Gull. Yes. And Caesar, he was a bloody Telugu called Kishore. Where the Telugu suddenly came from, I don't know. So I actually cracked up in the, there was much more to this. Uh, parts of my brain have burnt those cells out too, so that I don't do this again. And I was rolling on the floor and my wife got up in the middle of the night and was looking at me and said, what the hell is wrong with you? What happened? I thought you were having an attack or something. So yeah, you have nuts like this. Maya Sur started the Mayan civilization. Really? Okay, whatever. You know, so this happens all the time. Every single year, one student asks me, every single year, if not more than one student, sir, but Taj Mahal is really a Shiva temple, no? Yeah. And now I have it down pat. I, can, I think I'm going to record it one of these years. So I just play back from my phone. Then this isn't enough. Two years back, I thought it was bad enough about the Taj Mahal. I was told, sir, but uh, it is true, no? Kutub Minar was built by Prithviraj Chavan. What? Covered in verses from the Quran. Every single floor has a bloody plaque saying who built it. And there were different guys who built it. So it was a victory tower by Prithviraj Chavan. And people believe this. Sir, but my grandfather told me. So my mother won't lie to me about this, sir. I mean, how do I tell somebody that his mother's probably been conned into believing this, okay? She doesn't mean to lie to you. But somebody lied to your mother or somebody lied to whoever lied to your mother, told your mother this, and your mother believes it because she thinks it comes from a person in authority. The ultimate test, Krishnan, is there are two thin books on the period between 1857 and independence. One is Percival Spears, volume two of the history of India. And one is S.C. Roy's book on the same period. I've actually read them side by side. Same event. They're describing the same event. The same things happen. But both of them are analyzing it completely different. And I'm like, what the hell? And I'm trying to teach this for the first time in my life, okay? This is outside my comfort zone. I have to teach this to a bunch of students who are doing a bachelor's in heritage management. So in the second semester, I tell them, I'm going to give each of you all a topic. Presentation karo. Then after class presentation, I will correct all the presentations and take care of it. Post lunch, KC is on. We've been given this amazing auditorium in KC College. I'm sitting back, slightly snoozing. One of my top students in class is doing a presentation on 1857. And I suddenly jerk up. And I say, what? Say it again? And she says, the pork and beef fat greased bullets were a deep-rooted conspiracy by the British government to convert the standing Indian army to Christianity. 
I said, are you mad? Are you mad? But she said, sir, it's written in the 11th standard textbook. I didn't know what to say. I was completely and totally gobsmacked. What would they have done with so many Christians? If any, if any bloody government in the world ever, any colonial government did not proselytize, it was the British. Because they didn't care. They were Anglicans. They were not Roman Catholics. Why didn't you get it? But they believe this. Most people don't even know why that cartridge was greased. It's not a bullet. It's a cartridge. It looks like a toffee. It comes in a wrapper, a wrapper with a bullet and a measured bit of gunpowder. And to make sure that the toffee, it looks like a toffee roll actually. Okay? Doesn't get ruined because of dampness. You dip the thing in tallow. And you let it cool off after hot tallow. So it forms a sheath on the outside and keeps it waterproof. And that's why you have to bite the bullet. When you load it, you have to bite off the bullet end, pour in the gunpowder into your gun, spit your bullet into it, then put the wadding of the bloody paper into it, the wax paper, ram it down, pull back the hammer and fire the damn gun. And they all looked at me like this. Because, I mean, the government, it's official textbooks are so. And that's what really important, saying? yeah. I mean, I, rem I remember reading about this in school. I didn't do history in my 11th standard, but in, I remember somewhere from my school textbooks. This was part of the deal, and that was the <coughs> what what current academic you know current academic decision makers term the socialist textbook writers. It was still there. But you know, I remember to asking my dad about this uh, and Peter when I was in school about why would they wrap the cartridges. Uh, for the Indian Army specifically in pig fat and and cow fat. So my, my I remember my dad telling me that you know um, it's it's not just for the Indian soldiers. It is I mean everything that came uh, on a ship that could be affected with uh, you know moisture and the long sea journeys were wrapped in tallow. I mean whether it is machine parts or whether it is ammunition. Yes, and, yes, very true. Yeah, very true. Yeah. And I remember telling my, my schoolmates that and they're like, no, no, you're a you're a Catholic, you will say whatever you know your ancestors. <laughs> your ancestors, and, I like that. Yeah, right? yeah, my ancestors. Please apply for British passport. <laughs> Support immediately. Yeah, but you know, yeah. this is the ridiculous thing. I agree with Kyle about this. This is this is this is the nonsense that you get. So I had a crazy father who believed that there was nothing like a wrong question or a stupid question. So when I asked the teacher in class why, why you had to bite the bullet and why the bullet was covered in grease, why do you have to put a bullet in your mouth? You had a bullet, you put it in the gun and you fired it. I mean, why did you have to put it in your mouth? So she said, shut up, don't ask stupid questions. So that was a flag. I went home and told my dad. I said, she said, I asked a stupid question. He said, what was the question? I said, wait, I will tell you tomorrow. My dad went to a library to confirm everything and came back with drawing and book and explained to me what a bloody muzzle loader flintlock looked like mm. and how it was loaded. And I had a hallelujah moment at the age of, I think, 10 or 11. And I, I still find it amazing that people who go through, I do this to my classes and I regularly have 30 year old and 40 year old students say, oh, that is why they put it in the mouth. Why didn't you ask? No, we used to never ask the teacher because she didn't like questions being asked. Hmm. so when you don't pay your teachers enough and when teaching is not the priority of a teacher okay and is a job that you have to do because job teacher then then this is what you teach because you have a stack of notes for 30 years you cycle style the same notes for your class and you teach the same shit there's no hope for the system i'm happy outside the system Manita. I agree. But nowadays, the other trend is they don't even give notes. Like I was told in one of the subjects, you know, it's copywriting. And I said, it's a TY paper. So I won't be assessing them. So you you need to just give what, you know, they like, uh, no ma'am, uh, the coordinator said, uh, it's okay. Matlab, aap sikha do. I said, but what if, you know, copywriting is suitably vague, right? I come from advertising. I will teach what I know. What if your TY, the university sets the paper, right? From this year, I mean, whatever, the online paper. 
she's like we'll just hope for the best and prepare for the worst i'm like are you supposed to be the representative of students but yeah the education system i also have no hope especially seeing it as a visiting faculty wait you're on mute kurush <laughs> it's an ma examination your final year ma examination mm. you're doing mcqs yeah yeah history uh, ma examination in history your yeah. final exam is mcqs yeah. i mean wow you know way back in college i would earn a little bit of extra money during summers by being invigilator for exams right and the basic rule was that you couldn't be an invigilator for uh, a supervise the exam for an exam that you had already passed so by definition mostly it was courses that were people older than me right and so one set of exams there was the m8 people becoming teachers and as a teenager i had baby face all right so i wasn't taken seriously for a whole lot of th- things and i'm supervising this exam there are and a lot of people in the who come in to be uh, you know for the ba and ma are people who are older women not you know 20 20 25 year olds but women in their 30s and 40s as well who are coming back after having children and things like that coming back and deciding to qualify higher to whatever or they've done their ba and they're doing their ma later in life all of them older than me all trying to copy right and i'm like ma'am please don't copy <laughs> and they're like priceless they like you know this bachcha who looks like he's about 12 years old is telling us not to do and they like passing papers around that women in their 30s and 40s a few men here and there because men don't teach that men way. don't teach no no beard beard is what women do men don't do beard che che men and you know so i mean actually i had to call the head invigilator and, and you know like listen this is happening so he would stand there and then they would stop talking <laughs> till he went away yeah because i mean and these are the people who are going into the education system right they they becoming your teachers exactly we just have you ever been part of a refresher course <laughs> so refresher courses used to be held by deccan college for right. student for teachers who had to teach ancient and history culture and archaeology and most of the teachers would come from all over india for the refresher course which was made compulsory would only be interested in going shopping in pune's market men women and anybody else of indeterminate orientation or whatever gender choice or whatever it's called all wanted to only go shopping they were quite cut up that deccan college was a horrible bunch of people who actually expected them to attend lectures i mean Damn, it's fresh up. Was big deal. I know everything there is to teach in any case. My predecessor gave me notes from forty years ago. It's the same thing. History has not changed. I was like, history hasn't changed, but the investigations into history have changed. But yeah, that's the way it is. It's okay. You find new stuff. You find new material. You revise your views on history. You revise analysis, interpretation so changes. I have an excavation site, Peter, for which I'm trying to write an article just now without access to a library and going mad. uh it's a two year old excavation the results are just beginning to come in now to me from the experts small scale excavation we are going to take back the history of the konkan coast by 200 years in the historical period okay it's going to be scary because a lot of people are going to lamb into me and it's going to be fun to do and i'm just thinking that it will never make it to the textbooks me it will never make it to the textbooks not in my lifetime for sure that's how bad it is mm. so i'll publish academically the world might know about it i might get quoted in 17 obscure manuscripts somewhere and then that's about it mm. so social media gives me a place to shout about it yeah. and that's how a lot of good people that i know in archaeology are getting their work known i follow a shitload of archaeologists on twitter so sort of, most of the people i follow on twitter half of them are archaeologists from all over the world most of the others are science fiction science fantasy writers from around the world because those are my two reading passions and there's some food people uh mm-hmm. luckily get followed by more people than i follow and uh, yeah i share a lot of stuff that interests me in history and archaeology because of them and i learned so much which i would not have had access to so you know everything was originally published in journals 
excavation reports came out 20 years, 25 years later because work was being done on them. So we never got to see what had happened. The internet is a great level over there. And the sheer volume of data available and the fact that when I was doing my PhD, if I wrote to somebody in America for an article, for an off-print, I didn't expect a reply back for a month. I didn't expect the article back without two or three letters being written. But from America, from the UK, from Germany, I would get a reply. From Indian academics, I would not even get a reply. There was this one lady that I wrote to who I met three years after I wrote to her at a conference. I said, you know, I wrote to you twice. Ha, huh, I received some letters. I said, yeah, but so. And that's the way it was. So it was really the, the internet, internet and Gmail and social media have changed all of that. I now have access to people's articles on academia who I don't even know. Any article that I want, I first check whether the buggers on academia and most probably the articles have been uploaded there. I have people who actually told me, I've just written a book on this topic. Don't buy it. I'll send you a book like PDF. It's like, it's your book. You just published an academic book. You're going to sell me a book like PDF. I got one of my students to make it on his computer. There's no trace of it being mine. I'll have him send it to you tomorrow. There's another there's a whole separate issue there, which is the entire thing of academic publishing. Yeah. How expensive it can be for, I mean, who gets the money from a lot of academic publishing? And it's not- I Forget about who gets the money. Who can afford to buy the books? Yeah. Tell me that. So when I spoke to publishers, you know what they told me? That most publishers in India have a fixed set. They know that they will publish 300 volumes and the 200 volumes are already sold to 200 different university library who buy on principle from them and they get a cutback hmm. the librarians straight away I was like wow yeah that's the way it works uh, there's an excavation that I did at the beginning of my excavating career and I had nothing to compare with in the Indian subcontinent all I knew was that there was one site in southern Pakistan and one site in Sri Lanka called Mantai where excavation ceased because of the LTT problems. So I was desperately waiting for the Mantai report. When I went to Sri Lanka six years ago, I finally asked one of my Sri Lankan colleagues if I could get my hands on the Mantai report because I heard it was just out. And he said, can you afford it? So I thought, I felt that was quite downright insulting to ask whether I could afford to buy a copy. And I said, uh, why? He said, my library can't afford it. And I sat back because it's a university library. I said, luckily for us at the MA department, which is in Colombo, they have a copy, I'll get you access. So I went there and it was a 25,000 Sri Lankan rupee book. Not published in Sri Lanka, but 25,000 Sri Lankan rupees is like 12,000 Indian rupees for an excavation report. Damn, I couldn't afford it. Luckily, at the back of the, for whatever reason, and I think there that authors also do this because they realize that they want their book to be read. There was a CD. <coughs> hmm. I asked for permission to read the CD on one of their machines. I said, ah, oh, please, the machine lined up here. And the CD had an entire PDF of the same report. So I asked, I said, is this, is, can I copy a file from the CD? I said, ha, oh, sir, please go ahead. So I copied the report. I do follow some academics as well, and a lot of them tell me about this, that because of the, the the way that the finances are structured around academic publishing, the general advice is if there's something that there's a book out there, an academic book that you can't get your hands on, contact that author, very likely, they will just quietly send you a PDF. More often than not, hmm. more often than not, and they're very happy to disseminate data with you. Absolutely. Yeah. And people who are in it for the love of it, who are doing it because they want thing, they want that information out, they want their research to go out there, but they're getting stuck in. But you know, Prish, I just wanted to take on something that you were talking about earlier as well. This entire and what we've discussed in this this social media knowledge and people who are did show they know stuff. And we talk about you know to sort of bring it into the food area again. We're talking about proscriptions and prescriptions on food. And if you look at even someone like me, not an academic, someone who is not who is not read deeply of religious texts, 
can find very easily that, for instance, uh, in the Ramayana or, you know, mention of meat eating or food. I mean, where, what, what were, you know, Ram and Lakshman doing when Sita was abducted? They were out hunting. They were not hunting carrots. Right? Uh, Peter, but this is the problem. No, logic is something common. See, I keep saying the only thing common about common sense is the word common. Hmm. Nothing else is common about common sense. Hmm. So we don't have common sense. And that's the way it is. I've even had people tell me that uh, the Vanars were actually um, Neanderthals. They were Homo erectus who were still living in India during that time, 80,000 years ago. And I had to tell them that, you know, neither of them had tails and definitely not prehensile tails. Only South American monkeys have prehensile tails. So, oops. And they're like, you don't know what you're talking about. Just because you have never found a tail. Wow. Just because you've never found a tail. Thank you. Really. I mean, we have an entire sacrum from 3.4 million years ago. And you're telling me that they grow a tail after that. But yeah, this happened. So, see, and I have, Peter, I have people who refuse to accept that chilies didn't grow in India originally. And this is one of the most common things that people know about food. Yeah. I regularly get, no, no, you're lying. You Parsis will say anything. You're all British bootlickers. Where did that come from? Okay. Okay, now it's been uh, four hours, I think, that we've been at this. Yes. And if I don't go to bed, my wife is going to make sure I sleep on the sofa and I can't because the sofa is full of books. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, but yes, uh, any last questions from anyone in the audience or shall we wind this up? It is, uh, it's, it's, it's a quarter to one in India time. So we should be winding up soon. But thank you, everyone who stayed. I can see uh, Krishnan's wife walking in the background and saying, I, what the hell are you doing on for four hours on this? Circling me like a shark, to, asking me to quit. My wife has come, given me a mug of coffee and gone to bed. <laughs> yeah, I'm but... going to pay hell for this tomorrow. Yeah, no, clearly Monday morning blues. But table talks are known to last this long, I think. <laughs> and I... No, Monday morning blues. Monday is my day off. <laughs> Well, yeah. Oh, good for you. <laughs> Clearly, some of us will have Monday morning blues. And but yeah, thanks for putting this together. Are you sure you don't want to go for the record? My longest table talk so far has been five hours. No, thank you. you sure about this? <laughs> okay. Next time but Kurush come is here. coming twice. So technically, it's more than five hours <laughs> in that go. sense. <laughs> It's Thank seven you. hours or whatever, I'm sure. I missed the first talk, but yeah, I think it would be... I think Peter has a recording. If you're really sweet to him, he might share it with you. Yeah, I haven't. Him rose cookies. I haven't. Uh, I'll just sh formally end this one for the recording. Yes. And I'll just carry on for a few minutes. So, yeah, yeah. so thank you, everyone who has attended. I'm going to uh, cease the recording now, but it's been an absolute pleasure, Kurush, to uh, have this conversation. And uh, to those of you who joined in, Arzu was not here anymore. Uh, Raghu, Krishnan, Vanita, Kyle, and Ishita, Jai and the people from the audience. Thank you for your questions and for your involvement. And to the eight of you who were here till a few minutes ago and the six who are there now in the audience, thank you for staying with us for almost four hours. Uh, I mean, don't you guys have lives? But yeah, but uh, uh, thank you so much. This has been a lovely table talk and we'll catch you next time. Uh, someone who was here earlier in and probably has to go back to work tomorrow is going to be talking about meat and meat substitutes, uh, both lab-grown meat and plant-based meat substitutes that come in, which is the next table talk. So for now, this is Table Talk signing off, and thank you very much, and good night.